In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons, acting individually or in combination with others, in the presidential election of 1972, or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel -gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. The Senate Watergate Committee this afternoon adjourned for the week after hearing the former acting director of the FBI explain how there was constant White House pressure last summer to derail part of the FBI's investigation into Watergate. L. Patrick Gray says the White House, via John Dean, kept suggesting that Manuel Ogario, who ran the Mexico City money laundry, and Kenneth Dahlberg, a Nixon finance man in the Midwest, both had CIA connections that would be compromised by a continuing probe. Gray says that even while the CIA was telling him the fears were groundless, John Dean was urging that FBI interviews be delayed. Things finally got to a point in early July, Gray said, when he called campaign director Clark McGregor to complain. Within the hour, Gray recalls, he got a call from the president about another issue and used the opportunity to state his complaint in general, not specific terms. He was told to pursue the probe and later came to think of himself as an alarmist for harboring fears about White House pressure. It wasn't until months later, Gray says, that he realized he'd been right from the start. He also explained how he destroyed documents from Howard Hunt's safe and subsequently lied to his friend Lowell Weicker, a member of the committee, about how and when he destroyed the papers. It should be interesting when the committee begins to question Gray on Monday. Today's testimony at times may seem a maze of reconstructed telephone calls, conversations, and meetings. Well, to give you a vantage point from which to watch today's retelling of events, we have summarized some of these in chronological order. Remember, the Watergate break-in was on June 17, 1972. Patrick Gray first heard from the White House on June 21st, a call from John Ehrlichman warning him about leaks to the press, telling him Dean was investigating for the White House. Dean called later and then visited Gray. The next day, Gray called CIA Director Helms. Helms told him there was no CIA involvement. Then a meeting with Dean on the Mexican money. The next day, that meeting with Walters. It was earlier that day that General Walters and Director Helms met with Haldeman and Ehrlichman at the White House. It was on June 26 and June 27 that Walters talked to John Dean, requesting and Dean requested CIA assistance in asking him about a, Me about a Mexican operations of the CIA. Back to Patrick Gray, who got a call from Dean on the 27th. After that, Helms called to OK an interview with a Mexican lawyer. Then Dean called back, asking the interview be delayed. On the 28th, a series of calls from Dean, Ehrlichman, and Helms. The result, another delayed interview and a canceled meeting with CIA chiefs. It was on June 28th that Gray picked up the hunt files from Dean and Ehrlichman. On the 29th, Dean called to ask for another interview delay. Then another important series of conversations came on July 6th when Vernon Walters confirmed no CIA involvement in Watergate. That led Gray to call Clark McGregor to express uneasiness, and that was followed by the call from President Nixon. Watching the hearings with us today has been Georgetown University law professor Jack Murphy. Jack, what do you think are the most significant points for people to look for this evening? Well, I think the focus continues to be the... Uh interest of the White House in the CIA in this critical period a few days after the break-in. As Jim has uh, aptly summarized just now, the, the dates and times of meetings are uh, a maze, and it's very difficult, I think, to sort all that out as you watch. But I would point out in particular a couple of items which interested me enormously. One, <clears throat> forgive me, is the fact that while uh, Director Helms was able to assure the White House uh, in the June 23rd meeting and then with Mr. Dean on June 26th. Uh, Mr. Walters uh, met with Mr. Dean that the CIA would not be compromised if the investigation went forward. Uh, the fact is that no mention was made by either Walters or Helms at those meetings of something they apparently knew at that time, which was that Mr. Martinez, one of the persons arrested in the Watergate, was at the time of his arrest on, the, uh, on a retainer basis on the payroll of the CIA. This highlights something else you'll see, I think, in uh, 
General Walter's testimony, which is a protective urge with respect to the agency, a protective urge which I think we also observed yesterday in uh, Director Helm's testimony. They didn't want the CIA to be uh, linked to this. They did what they could to keep it away from publicity. General Walters will speak about the uh, lack of desirability of a fight uh, which would bring the CIA into the limelight. Uh, he did not want to have to put his word against John Dean's on the question of whether or not there was something peculiar going on here. So I think that the focus there, and there are many other details which will develop, is one that the viewer might most profitably follow as he uh, follows this maze of a calendar of phone calls and meetings uh, in the next uh, few hours. Thank you. We'll talk to Jack Murphy again when the hearings are over later tonight. And NPAC's Peter Kay will explore the future course of the hearings with Chief Counsel Sam Dash at the conclusion of our playback. This is a relatively short day, hence our program tonight won't keep you up until the wee hours. So that you can plan your viewing, here is NPAC's hour-by-hour -hour rundown. In the first hour, General Walters, the CIA's deputy director, says that White House counsel John Dean kept pressing him to tell the FBI to call off its investigation into the so-called Mexican connection between Nixon campaign contributions and the Watergate break-in. Walters says he told Dean that if the White House insisted on a course of action that might compromise the CIA, I would resign. Much of the second hour was devoted to General Walters' second-hand report of a July 6th conversation between Patrick Gray and President Nixon. Walters said Gray told Mr. Nixon to get rid of those involved because the investigation of the Watergate break-in could lead quite high in the government. In hour number three, General Walters has read a long series of letters from James McCord to a friend at the CIA. Walters says he wasn't aware of the letters. The letters chronicle attempts to get McCord to admit that there was CIA involvement in Watergate. Also in that hour, Walters is asked why his account of his White House marching orders conflicts with H.R. Haldeman's. Walters says, I will stand on my recollection. In the fourth hour, Patrick Gray testifies that he canceled interviews with Kenneth Dahlberg and a Mexican lawyer after John Dean urged him to, allegedly because of national security matters. He said he became concerned when General Vernon Walters could not give him a written statement to support reports of CIA involvement. In hour number five, Gray confirms he told President Nixon, people on your staff are trying to mortally wound you. And in detailing how and why he destroyed the files from Howard Hunt's safe, Gray says that was a grievous misjudgment. Now to the proceedings themselves and Senator Irvin. The committee... The committee will come to order. General Walters, would you stand up, please, sir, and hold up your right hand. You swear that the evidence that you shall give to the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Thanks. General, suppose you're just to give us your full name and address for the, for the purposes of the record. My name is Vernon Walters, Vernon A. Walters. I am the Deputy Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. I am, at the present time, Acting Director until Mr. Colby is sworn in after having been confirmed by the Senate. And I live in Arlington, Virginia. Thank you, sir. I am a Lieutenant General in the United States Army. Uh, General Walters, how long have you had the position as Deputy Director of the CIA? Since the 2nd of May, 1972 is the day I was sworn in. Prior to obtaining that position, uh, what position did you have? I was the defense attaché to France. And how long were you in that Four position? and a half years. Now, prior to your joining the CIA, could you just briefly tell yeah. us what contacts, if any, you've had with um, uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Nixon? My first contact with uh, President Nixon was when he was Vice President. I was detailed to accompany him on a trip around South America. Uh, I went to eight countries with him and served as his interpreter and translator and aide at that time. In two of those countries, I was in the car with Mr. Nixon when extreme violence was encountered, mob violence. And if I were to tell this committee that I did not feel admiration and respect for the courage and calmness Mr. Nixon showed at that time, I would not be telling you the whole truth. 
subsequently i saw i did not work for mr nixon again during the period between the time he left the vice presidency and the time he really became president i saw him perhaps two or three years in those two or three times in those eight years after he became president i went on two or three of the trips abroad he took to countries where i spoke the language and could translate for him uh, I have not had any private conversation with the president since I became deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency, that is, since May 2nd. Did you, shortly actually after you became deputy director of the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, did you attend a meeting at the White House uh, with Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ellerkman and Director Helms on June 23, 1972? Yes, I did. Could you tell us how that meeting was arranged? During the morning of the 23rd of June, I received a phone call, I do not recall exactly how, telling me that I was to be there at Mr. Ehrlichman's office on... You say you received one, a telephone call yes. from home. I do not know whether I received it personally or my secretary received it, just stating that I was to be at Mr. Ehrlichman's office with Mr. Helms. It may have come from Mr. Helms' secretary uh, at 1.30 that afternoon. Mr. Helms and I went downtown. We did not know what the subject of the meeting was. We had lunch together, and at 1.30 we went to Mr. Ehrlichman's office. All right, all right, now, will you, to the best of your recollection, relate uh, the discussion that was had at that meeting, uh, uh, by the way, who, who could you say actually was doing most of the talking at the meeting? I believe Mr. Haldeman was doing nearly all of the talking. I do not recall Mr. Ehrlichman actually participating actively in the, con in the conversation. All right, now would you relate to the committee uh, what Mr. Haldeman said and what you or Mr. Helms said? Mr. Haldeman said that the bugging of the Watergate was creating a lot of noise, that uh, the opposition was attempting to maximize this, uh, that the FBI was investigating this and the leads might lead to some important people. And he then asked uh, Mr. Helms what the agency connection was. And Mr. Helms replied quite emphatically that there was no agency connection. And Mr. Haldeman said that uh, nevertheless, the pursuit of the FBI investigation in Mexico might uncover some CIA activities or assets. Mr. Helms said that he had told Mr. Gray on the previous day, the acting director of the FBI, that there was no agency involvement, that none of the investigations being carried out by the FBI were in any way jeopardizing any agency activity. Mr. Haldeman then said, Nevertheless, there is concern that these investigation, this investigation in Mexico may expose some covert activity of the CIA. And it has been decided that General Walters will go to Director Gray, Acting Director Gray, and tell him that the further pursuit of this investigation in Mexico, and I wish to emphasize that the only question of investigation involved was Mexico, the investigation in Mexico, could jeopardize some assets of the Central Intelligence Agency. Again, Mr. Helms said uh, he was not aware of any activity of the agency that could be jeopardized by this. Mr. Haldeman repeated, nevertheless, there is concern that the further pursuit of this investigation will uncover some activity or asset of the CIA in Mexico, and it has been decided that you will go and tell this addressed to me. You will tell this to Acting Director Gray. Well, well now, Mr. Walters, uh, <clears throat> could it have been that Mr. Haldeman uh, or asked you or Mr. Helms to go to Mr. Gray, uh, to Mr. Gray and to um, first inquire at the CIA whether or not there might be some um, problem at the CIA if there was an investigation in Mexico, I rather not. than saying it was decided? that you should go? I do not recall it being put in a question form. It was put in a directive form. In other words, you understood that to be a, a direction. I understood that to be the direction. And since Mr. Haldeman was very close to the top of the governmental structure of the United States, 
and as mr helms testified yesterday the white house has a great deal of information that other people do not have i had been with the agency approximately six weeks at the time of this meeting i found it quite conceivable that mr haldeman might have some information that was not available to me and you did not feel it appropriate at that time to inquire mr haldeman why it was that he was directing you to go to mr gray and tell that mr gray no i did not i if i had felt there was any impropriety in this request i would have given him the same answer i later gave mr dean that i would resign rather than do it so it was did you uh, wonder why it was that mr haldeman said it was decided that you uh, general waters should go to see mr gray not not the director helms yes i did a number of hypotheses crossed my mind i thought perhaps he thinks i'm military and a lot of people have the mistaken belief that military obey blindly uh i thought he might have heard reports that there had been some friction in the past between the fbi and the cia and perhaps since mr gray was new in the job and i was new in the job that that might be a good way to start out i did wonder about it but i didn't uh, this was his privilege to do it any way he wished now uh, general waters did there come a time when you uh, put in writing in the form of a memorandum your recollection of that meeting on june 23 1972 they did mr dash 5 days later when this thing started uh, i do not habitually keep memoranda of my conversations however when on the tuesday the following tuesday mr dean put the question to me or didn't put the question but explored the possibility of the cia going bail and paying the salaries of the suspects who were in jail i realized it was time for me to start keeping a record So following that second meeting on the 27th I sat down and I wrote memoranda for myself they were not intended to be a verbatim account of the conversation or to cover all aspects of the conversation but notes to jog my own memory I wrote a memorandum on the meeting with Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman I wrote a memorandum on the meeting with Mr. Gray I wrote a memorandum on my first meeting with Mr. Dean on Monday the 26th and a memorandum of my second meeting with Mr. Dean on the 27th On the 28th I met with Mr. Dean for the third and last time and I wrote a memorandum I believe the following day. On the subsequent memoranda, my namely my calls on uh, Mr. Gray, I wrote those memoranda either on the same day that I had the talk with Mr. Gray or the following day. I if I may I would like to make one point clear. Uh I have been uh, alleged to have a splendid memory and so forth and here I must make a confession that I'm afraid will not fit in with it. Mr. Helms was quite right in his testimony yesterday in that the question regarding bail and paying the salaries of these people came up on Tuesday. When I reviewed my notes and before I wrote the affidavit, I did correct this in my affidavit, namely that the request regarding bail I will the defendants was on John Walters will get close to that and I think you can restate that. uh when i ask you about the meetings uh, with mr dean i want to show you a copy we have of a memorandum uh purportedly from you uh or written by you on june 28th covering the june 23rd meeting and ask you if this is a uh, correct copy of right. the memorandum Yes, Mr. Dash, it is. Mr. Chairman, may, may that copy be uh marked as a an exhibit and introduced without objection on the part of any committee member it is ordered that this copy be marked appropriately as an exhibit and received in evidence as such. Now, General Waters, after you left the meeting with Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman, did you leave it with the uh, Uh, Director Helms, former Director Helms. I did. We walked downstairs and we stood and talked close to the car out in the West Executive Avenue. And Mr. Helms uh, said to me, "You must remind the, uh, Mr. Gray of the agreement between the FBI and the CIA that if they run into or appear to be about to expose one another's assets, they will notify one another. And you should remind him of this." Uh And then and I did. Then what did you do? I do not recall whether I went back to the agency or not. I don't think time would have allowed it because the appointment had been made to see Mr. Gray at 
Uh, I, my recollection is not clear on this, whether I went back to the agency or whether I stayed downtown. I have a feeling I stayed downtown. And at 2.30, I went to see Mr. Gray. I know, was Mr. Gray, by the way, expecting your visit? Mr. Gray, I believe, was expecting my visit. How do you know that? Uh, I believe he has subsequently testified that Mr. Dean had told him that I was on my way down. All right, now, would you briefly relate to your best recollection what conversation you had with Mr. Gray at that time? This was on June 23rd, 1972. I said to Mr. Gray that I had just come from the White House where I had talked to some senior staff members, and I was to tell him that the pursuit of the FBI investigation in Mexico, the continuation of the FBI investigation in Mexico, could, might uncover uh, some covert activities of the Central Intelligence Agency. I then repeated to him what Mr. Helms had told me about the agreement between the FBI and CIA, and he said he was quite aware of this and he intended to observe it uh, scrupulously. Now, did you tell him uh, who gave you the direction to... I did uh, not. I told him I talked to some senior people at the White House. Right. Now, did you... Uh, was, that, was that the sum and substance of that conversation? Did Gray say anything? I believe so. We expressed pleasure at meeting one another. I'd been intending to call on him and so forth. And uh, anything else that occurred will, will, I believe, be covered in the memorandum, which is in your possession. And I think you've testified that you also, on June 28th, uh, included a memorandum uh, of the meeting with Mr. Gray uh, on June 23rd. And I'd like to show you a copy of um, the memorandum and ask you if uh, this is a correct copy and does cover the uh, testimony you've just given. Yes, it is a correct copy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may that uh, memorandum be marked as an exhibit and uh, received in evidence? It's, it's an absence of objection by any committee member that is so altered and be appropriately marked as an exhibit and received in evidence as such. Now, after you met <clears throat> with Mr. Gray, uh, did you return to the, um, uh, your offices at the CIA? And yes, I did. And did you make a report of that meeting to uh, former Director Helms? I did. And, and uh, I also started to check on whether this was a fact. I talked to the people in our geographic area that handles Mexico. And I'm not sure whether this was complete on the Friday afternoon or whether it was completed Monday morning. But it was soon clear to me that nobody who was responsible for that area in the agency felt that the ongoing FBI investigation could jeopardize any of the agency's sources or activities in Mexico. Well, now, did you subsequently receive any communication from anybody at the White House after June 23rd? On Monday morning, the 26th of June, I received a phone call from a man who identified himself as John Dean, and he said he wished to speak to me about the matters that Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman had discussed with me on the Friday. I did not know Mr. Dean, and I expressed some, uh, something to the effect of, I don't know who you are. And he said, well, you can call Mr. Ehrlichman to see whether it's all right to talk to me or not. Did you call Mr. Ehrlichman? I called Mr. Ehrlichman. I had some difficulty in reaching him, but finally I reached him, and I said, uh, a Mr. John Dean wants to talk to me about the matters which I discussed with you, with Mr. Haldeman on the preceding Friday, and he said, yes, it's all right to talk to him. He's in charge of the whole matter. All right, then you, did you then meet with Mr. Dean I then, on that day on I the then 26th? called Mr. Dean again, and he asked me to come down and see him, I believe, at 11.30 or 11.45. I believe it's indicated on the memorandum I wrote. All right, would you relate to the committee the conversation you had with Mr. Dean at that time on June 26, 1972? Mr. Dean said that he was handling this uh, whole uh, matter of the Watergate, that uh, it was causing a lot of trouble, that it was very embarrassing, the FBI was investigating it, the leads had led to some important people and might lead to some more important people. Uh, the FBI was proceeding on three hypotheses, namely that this break-in had been organized by the Republican National Committee, by the Central Intelligence Agency, or by someone else. 
Whereupon I said, I don't know who else organized it, but I know that the Central Intelligence Agency did not organize it. I said, furthermore, I have I related to my conversation with Mr. Dean, Mr. Haldeman, and Mr. Ehrlichman on the previous Friday and told him I had checked within the agency and found that there was nothing in any of the ongoing FBI investigations that could jeopardize CIA activities or sources or compromise them in any way in Mexico. He then said, uh, well, couldn't this have happened without your knowledge? Well, I said, originally, perhaps, but I've inquired. I've talked to Mr. Helms, and I am sure that we had no part in this operation against the Democratic National Committee. Well, he kept pressing this. There must have been. These people all used to work for the CIA and all of this thing. I said, maybe they used to, but they weren't when they did it. And he pressed and pressed on on this and asked if there wasn't some way I could help. And it seemed to me that he was exploring perhaps the option of seeing whether he could put some of the blame on us. It wasn't any specific thing he said, but the general tenor was in this way. And I said to him, uh, I did not have an opportunity to consult with anybody. I simply said, Mr. Dean, uh, any attempt to involve the agency in the stifling of this affair would be a disaster. It would destroy the credibility of the agency with the Congress, with the nation. It would be a grave disservice to the president. I will not be a part to it, and I am quite prepared to resign before I do anything that will implicate the agency in this matter. Uh, this seemed to shock him somewhat. I said that uh, anything that would involve any of these government agencies like the CIA or the FBI in anything improper in this way would be a disaster for the nation. Uh, somewhat reluctantly, he seemed to accept this uh, line of argument. Well, now, left. General Walter, since you had made the check <clears throat> prior to seeing Mr. Dean concerning whether, in fact, uh, any FBI investigation in, the Me in Mexico would um, seriously or not seriously involve any covert activities of the CIA. And you reported that to Mr. Dean at this meeting. Uh, did you believe that you were responding uh, at that meeting then to the concern that you had received at the earlier meeting uh, uh, from the, the statement from Mr. Haldeman? Yes, Mr. Dash, I did, and at the risk of perhaps seeming naive in retrospect, it did not occur to me at that time that Mr. Dean would not tell Mr. Gray. Since Mr. Gray had told me he was in touch with Mr. Dean, Mr. Dean had told me he was in touch with Mr. Gray. In retrospect, I should, of course, have called Mr. Gray directly. I regret that I did not. And you had been informed by Mr. Ehrlichman when you checked as to whether you should talk to Mr. Dean, that Mr. Dean was a person you could talk to, that he was handling the matter. That is correct. Now. I think when you were testifying just a little while ago, uh, you said that you may have incorrectly put in your memorandum of the June 26th meeting something that should have been in another meeting. Uh, I want to show you your memorandum uh, or a memorandum that appears to be a memorandum but prepared by you on June 28th uh, dealing with the conversation you had with uh, Mr. Dean on June 26th and ask you if um, uh, you want to make a correction as to that memorandum for the record. You'll notice, General Waters, that there is an excised portion of that memorandum which has been cut out, and on our receipt of that, that uh, appears to be matters in which uh, dealt with either national security and therefore was excised. I am very appreciative of the committee for doing this. Uh, yes, it does. If I were to make a correction, it's somewhat complicated. It would really be that one, two, three, the fourth paragraph, the sixth and seventh paragraphs belong to the conversation of the 27th rather than the conversation of the 26th. And that dealt with the question of use bail. money, bail mo money from the CIA. That is correct. This is a correct it copy. It is a correct of copy of your memorandum. Yes, Mr. Is. Chairman, uh, could we have that memorandum marked as an exhibit and receive an evidence? The memorandum will be appropriately <clears throat> numbered as an exhibit and received in evidence as such. <clears throat> now, after that meeting with Mr. Dean on June 26, did you report back to former Director Helms? I did. And I told Mr. Helms what it generally what had transpired, and he approved of my firm stand with Dean. And. Uh, I related in some detail the various 
the matters that I had discussed with Mr. Dean and the fact that I had told Mr. Dean that no agency assets would be compromised by the pursuit of the FBI investigation in Mexico. I think you mentioned earlier that you did again meet with Mr. Dean. When did you next meet with Mr. Dean? On the following morning, the 27th of June, I received another telephone call from Mr. Dean summoning me down to his office. I went down to Mr. Dean's office. I believe the time is indicated in the memorandum, 11, 1130. I think 1145. 1145. And uh, Mr. Dean said that uh, the investigation was continuing, that some of the suspects were wobbling and might talk. And I said, well, that's just too bad, but it has nothing to do with us because nothing that they can say can implicate the agency. So he again said, haven't you discovered something about agency involvement in this matter? And I said, no, I have not discovered anything about agency involved in this matter. And he said, well, isn't there something that the agency can do to help? I said, I don't see how we can be helpful. And then he, then he said, well, would there be any way in which you could go bail or pay the salaries of these def defendants while they're in jail? And I said, no way. To do so would implicate the agency in something in which it is not implicated. I will have no part in this. Again, I went through the reasoning of the appalling effect it would have. I made plain to him that if the agency were to intervene in this, it would become known in the leaking atmosphere in Washington that it would be a total disaster. And I, I would like to say, if I may at this point, that I have not spent the whole of my adult life in the Central Intelligence Agency. I joined it for the first time in May of 1972. But I am convinced that an effective CIA is essential if the United States is to survive as a free and democratic society in the rough world in which we live. And I was determined that I would not see it destroyed or implicated as, as might be desired in this uh, business. I further told uh, Mr. Dean that when we expended funds, covert funds within the United States, we were required to report this to our Congressional Oversight Committees, and this seemed to cool his enthusiasm considerably. We had a few more discussions, and again, he asked me whether there was any way we could be helpful, and I said, no, we could not. Did you, by the way, uh, uh, on the meeting on the 28th of June, um, do you have a copy of your memoranda with you? Yes, I do. This is the, the meeting of the 28th or the memorandum written on the 28th? No, uh, the, the meeting of the following day of the meeting, <coughs> meeting you've just testified to on, on the, the 28th. 28th. Yes, I do. Yes. Uh. First, let me show you your copy of, a mem uh, of the memorandum you prepared on June 29th of your meeting on June 27th and ask if this is a uh, correct copy of that meeting. Yes, it is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if we can have that marked for identification and received. That will be marked, be appropriately numbered as a, an exhibit and, re and received in evidence as such. All right. Uh, now, General Wars, the very next day, uh, it appears that you had another meeting with Mr. Dean. That is By the correct. way, did you report to former Director Helms on your 27th meeting? Mr. Helms was extremely interested in this whole business, and I reported to him immediately on returning to the agency on each occasion. Now, on the 28th is when you began to write these memorandums, is that right? And uh, uh, could you then uh, tell, the, tell the committee uh, what caused you to begin to put this down in writing? Well, as soon as he broached the question of bail, and paying the salaries of these defendants, I realized that for the first time this was a clear indication that something improper uh, was being explored. 
And I discussed this with Mr. Helms, and we agreed. Again, I don't know whether he or I suggested that we write the memorandum, that I write the memoranda on these meetings and keep a record of them. And that is how the memoranda came to be reckoned. It will be noted that I wrote five of them practically on the same day to catch up with the past. Yes. All right, now, the meeting on the 28th, uh, it appears, was a fairly significant meeting because it was a follow-up again and a third meeting that you had uh, with uh, Mr. Dean. Do you have a copy of that memorandum? Uh, of my meeting on the 28th? Yes, yes. Yes, I do. Prepared on June 29th, That's correct. I do have it. Uh, would you read that memorandum in full, um, uh, General Walter? On the 28th of June, at 11.30, John Dean asked me to see him at his office in the Executive Office Building. I saw him alone. He said that the director's meeting, that is Director Helms' meeting, with Patrick Gray, FBI director, was canceled and that John Ehrlichman had suggested that Gray deal with me instead. The problem was how to stop the FBI investigation beyond the five suspects. Leads to two other people, Ken Dahlberg and a Mexican named Gena. Dean said that $89,000 was unrelated to the bugging case and Dahlberg was refusing to answer questions. Dean then asked, hopefully, whether I could do anything or had any suggestions. I repeated that as deputy director, I had no independent authority. I was not in the channel of command and had no authority other than that given to me by the director. The idea that I could add, act independently was a delusion and had no basis in fact. Dean then asked what might be done, and I said I realized he had a tough problem. But if there were agency involvement, it could be only a presidential directive and the political risks that were concomitant appeared to me to be unacceptable. At present, there was a high explosive bomb, but interventions such as he had suggested would transform it into a megaton hydrogen bomb. The present caper was awkward and unpleasant. Directed intervention by the agency could be electorally mortal if it became known and the chances of keeping it secret until the election were almost nil. I noted that scandals had a short life in Washington and other new spicier ones soon replaced them. I urged him not to become unduly agitated by this one. He then asked if I had any ideas, and I said that this affair already had a strong Cuban flavor. Everyone knew the Cubans were conspiratorial. Anxious to know the policies of both parties would be towards Castro. They therefore had a plausible motive for attempting this amateurish job which any skilled technician would deplore. This might be costly, but it would be plausible. Dean said that he agreed this was the best tack to take. It might cost a half a million dollars. He also agreed for the second time that agency ri the risks of agency involvement were unacceptable. After a moment's thought, he said that he felt that Gray's cancellation of his appointment with Director Helms might well be reversed in the next few hours. Dean thanked me, and I left. Oh, first, um, uh, General Waters, what was this meeting uh, to be held on June 28th, which was canceled? I did not know, Mr. Dash. I did not know what he was talking about. I presume that some arrangement outside of me had been made for Director Helms to see Mr. Gray. But in any event, as your memorandum shows, that Mr. Ehrlichman had indicated that uh, he had preferred that Gray meet with you uh, on an ongoing basis. This is what Mr. Right. Dean said to me. Now, could you tell... Uh, Tell the committee at least what your impression was that, uh, co concerning that part of your memorandum where you say, where you said this might be costly, concerning uh, a, a Cuban conspiratorial uh, plot, and Dean's statement that he agreed that this was the best tack to take, but it might cost half a million dollars. Yes, Mr. Dash. Uh, Dean went back at this point in the conversation, as I remembered, to the three hypotheses. Uh, and he was sort of saying, who could have done this? Who could have done this? He did not indicate at any time that he knew who, where the origin of this was. Quite frankly, at this point, my principal purpose was to divert him from pursuing the option of uh, involving the agency in this. I had read, I believe, about that time an article in the newspaper with a, which uh, put out a hypothesis that the Cubans might have been at the origin of this in order to try and find out what the policies of the Democratic Party would be if it were elected in 1972. Uh, this is what I basically said to Dean, that the Cubans had a plausible motive for doing this. Mr. Dean obviously understood this as a suggestion of mine that he should try and blame the Cubans. In retrospect, as so often been said here from this table, I should have corrected it. Frankly, I was so relieved that 
seeing him apparently abandoning the idea of involving the agency, or at least retreating on the idea of involving the agency, that I did not correct his impression when he said he obviously thought I was suggesting he could buy the Cubans. Was, was that the, <clears throat> would that be the inference that uh, Mr. Dean's statement it might cost a half a million dollars would uh, require actually paying somebody off in I order believe to take so, position? But I would like simply to state that just as I believed agency involvement could not be hidden, false implication of the Cubans could not be sustained. I should have corrected Mr. Dean at this point and said this is not what I was meaning. I was I, advancing a theory, but I did not. Uh, General Walters, I'd like to, you've read it, read your memorandum, and I have an exact copy of the memorandum here. I'd like to uh, show it to you, dated June 29th, covering your meeting with Mr. Dean on June 28th, and ask you to look at it and indicate if this is a copy. Yes, it is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, may I have uh, this uh, memorandum marked as an exhibit and uh, uh, received in evidence? It will be uh, <clears throat> appropriately numbered as an exhibit received in evidence as such. Now, did you receive, General Walters, a call from Mr. Gray on July 5, yes, 1972. Uh, Mr. Dash, I did, at 10 minutes to 6 in the evening. And uh, could you tell us briefly what that call was about? I believe that Mr. Gray said to me at this point that uh, uh, the pressures were mounting to continue the investigation, and that unless he received a written letter from Mr. Helms or from me to the effect that the further pursuit of this investigation in Mexico would uncover CIA assets or activities, he would have to go ahead with the investigation. I did not wish to discuss this with Mr. Gray over the telephone. I told him I would come down and see him the first thing the next morning. This was at the end of the business day. It was at 10 minutes to 6 in the evening. And did you uh, go down the next morning and see him? Yes, I did. Would you briefly tell the committee what the nature of your conversation was with Mr. Gray at that time? I told Mr. Gray right at the outset that I could not tell him, and even less could I give him a letter saying that the pursuit of the FBI's investigation would in any way jeopardize CIA activities in Mexico. I had to, I told him I had to be quite frank with him. I recounted the meeting with uh, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman. I told him that I had seen Mr. Dean on three occasions, that I had told Mr. Dean what Mr. Dean had told me. Uh, Mr. Gray uh, seemed uh, quite disturbed by this, and we both agreed that we could not allow our agencies to be used in a way that would be detrimental to their integrity. Uh, since I'm discussing what someone else said, I would like to refer here uh, to the, my memorandum. Now, this memorandum, unlike the others, was written, I believe, uh, on the same day that I saw Mr. Gray. Yes, would, would you uh, refer to your memorandum and read what you want from it, uh, General Walters? Well, I think basically this was it. I said. Uh, I could not give him a letter to this effect. I couldn't tell him this, and I could not give him a letter to the effect that further investigation uh, would uh, compromise assets of the CIA. He said he understood this. He himself had told Hall Ehrlichman and Haldeman that he could not possibly suppress the investigation of the matter. Even within the FBI, there were leaks. He had called in the components of his field office and chewed them out for these leaks. I said the only basis on which he and I could deal was absolute frankness, and I wished to recount my involvement in the case. I told him of the meeting at the White House with Mr. Helms. I did not mention Haldeman or Ehrlichman's name. I told him that uh, I had been directed to tell him that the investigation of this case further in Mexico uh, could compromise some CIA activities. Uh, Subsequently, I had seen Mr. Dean, the White House counsel, and told him that whatever the current implica pl unpleasant implications of the Watergate were, that to implicate the agency would not serve the president, would enormously increase the risk to the president. I had a long association with the president and was desirous of anyone, as anyone of protecting him. I did not believe that a letter from the agency asking the FBI to lay off this investigation on the spurious grounds that it would uncover covert operations would serve the president. Such a letter in the current atmosphere of Washington would become known and could be, frankly, electorally mortal. 
I said quite frankly that I would write such a letter only on direction from the President and only after explaining to him how dangerous I thought this action would be to him and if I were really pushed on this matter, I would be prepared to resign. Mr. Gray thanked me for my frankness. He said he could not suppress this investigation within the FBI. He had told Mr. Kleindienst this. He had told Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman that he would prefer to resign, but that his resignation would raise, that his resignation would raise many questions that would be detrimental to the President's interests. He did not see why he or I should jeopardize the integrity of our organization to protect some middle-level White House figure who had acted imprudently. He was prepared to let this go to Ehrlichman, to Haldeman, or to Mitchell. He felt it was important that the President should be protected from his would-be protectors. He had explained to Dean, as well as to Haldeman and Ehrlichman, he had explained this. Uh, finally, I uh, said that if I were directed to write a letter to him saying the future investigation of this case would jeopardize the security of the United States and covert operations of the agency, I would ask to see the President and explain to him the disservice I thought this would do to his interests. The potential danger to the President of such a course far outweighed any protective aspects it might have for other figures in the White House, and I was quite prepared to resign on this issue. Mr. Gray said that this is a very awkward matter for us to come up at the outset of our tenure. He looked forward to good relations between our two agencies, thanked me for my frankness, and that was it. All right, uh, General Waters, I'd like to show you uh, a copy we have of your memorandum of July 6, covering your meeting with Mr. Gray on July 6, and ask if this appears to be a correct copy. Yes, it does. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, may we have this exhibit uh, marked and received in evidence? This will, this will be marked appropriately as an exhibit and received in evidence as such. Now, General Walters, uh, did there come a time shortly after, uh, several days after, that you met with uh, Mr. Uh, Gray again, Acting Director Pat yes, uh, I did. Patrick Gray? Yes, I did. Can you tell I us the purpose of that meeting and what was discussed at that time? Uh, we had been passing. By the way, when was this? It was on the third. It was on the twelfth of July, Mr. Dash. In the meantime, the CIA had been cooperating fully with the FBI investigation, passing them all the material we had on these former employees of ours and any other matters that were of interest to them. Uh, we were continuously passing them memoranda, and I believe that on this day I was still acting director. Mr. Helms was in Australia on his way back from Australia, and as I recall it, uh, I gave him another uh, memorandum uh, on this date uh, covering various things that had been brought out that we had given Hunt concerning the assistance given to Hunt, which had been terminated in August 1971. Now, did the, uh, did, during this meeting with Mr. Gray, did Mr. Gray tell you that he had received a call from the President? Uh, yes, he did. Uh, could you read that part of your memorandum where uh, he discussed that call? Uh, he said, last Friday, I believe that may have been the day of my previous conversation with him. I do not have a calendar in front of me. This was written on the 12th. It was the preceding Friday. He had received a phone call from the president. The president had called him to congratulate him on the FBI action, which had frustrated the airplane hijacking in San Francisco. Towards the end of the conversation, the President asked him if he had talked to me about the case. Gray replied that he had. The President then asked him what his recommendation was in this case. Gray had replied that the case could not be covered up. It would lead quite high, and he felt the President should get rid of the people that were involved. Any attempt to involve the FBI or the CIA in this case would only prove a mortal wound. And then I put in brackets, he used my words, because these were the words I had used in talking to Mr. Gray. The president then said that I should get rid of whoever is involved, no matter how high. Gray replied that this was his recommendation. The president asked what I thought, and Gray said that my views were the same as his. The president took it well and thanked Gray. Uh, in all fairness, uh, I must say that and Mr. Gray did tell me, and I did not put it in here, that the President had told him to go ahead with his investigation. Do you wish me to go on reading? Uh, oh, that, that, does that complete uh, the, Mr. Gray's um, uh, statement to you concerning his call from the President? 
Yes, it did. We again philosophized some more, as is shown in the memorandum, concerning the need for the president to be protected from his would-be protectors. All right, uh, General Walters, I'd like to show you your memorandum on July 13th, uh, which uh, deals with this meeting uh, with uh, act the former acting uh, FBI director, L. Patrick Gray, and ask if this is a correct copy. Yes, it is. Mr. Chairman, may we have this memorandum marked as an exhibit and receive an evidence? This memorandum will be marked, appropriately marked, or numbered as an exhibit and received in evidence as such. Now, General Waters, did you uh, have occasion on July 28, 1972, uh, to uh, call on Mr. Gray again? Yes, I did. And could you tell us briefly what the purpose of that visit was? Uh, briefly, I came down to give him additional information for which he had asked relating to one of our people who had been in contact with Mr. Hunt during August of 1971. Uh, I gave him additional data concerning this uh, and concerning contacts with Mr. Hunt. I believe they are identified in the memorandum. Uh, towards the end of the conversation, Gray asked me, and I am here reading, if the president had called me on this matter, and I said that he had not. Gray then said that a lot of pressure had been brought on him in this matter, but he had not yielded. I can't read my anything in there. That was a fairly, fairly Mine is very poor reading here. Well, but anyway, anything to destroy the integrity of our two agencies would be the worst disservice we could do to the president, and I would not do it. He said he would not either. Then he made some reference to money, which was not totally clear to me. I then told him that we would terminate a phone which we had, which had been a number that had been given to Hunt to contact us two or three years before. And he then said, this is a hell of a thing to happen to us at the outset of our tenure in our respective offices, and I very heartily agree. Now, this, did this refer to, uh, did, did you know what uh, this reference to Mr. Hunt and any uh, assistance that had been given to Mr. Hunt and the CIA um, uh, was all about? As you know, Mr. Dash, all this occurred a year and a half before I came to the agency. I really wasn't familiar with it. The we agency was continuously passing to the FBI material that was uncovered concerning this contact or assistance to uh, Mr. Hunt, I believe. One of the memoranda I took to Mr. Gray really summed up a whole series of shorter memoranda we had sent him. And this was just an ongoing process. After this date, of the 28th of July. I no longer participated in this process. It was done directly through our liaison with the FBI, uh, through Mr. Colby and various others. But I take it that the memorandum and the, re and the references to the contact with Mr. Hunt related back to the prior year, July 71. Yes, they uh, did. Uh, meetings that uh, General Cushman had with Mr. Uh, Hunt. That is, that is correct. Uh, uh, I'd like to show you a, a copy we have of uh, your memorandum dated July 28th, covering your meeting with Mr. Gray on that same date, and ask if it's a correct copy. And you'll notice there are some excisions there of names that uh, were excised uh, because of uh, security reasons, national security reasons. Yes, it's as bad as Xerox copy is mine. Yes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, may that memorandum be appropriately um, uh, marked and uh, received in evidence? The uh, memorandum will be uh, appropriately numbered as an exhibit and received in evidence as such. Now. When was your next contact with um, anybody at the White House, uh, General Walters? This was, was this your last series of meetings? I think well, you said that from there on in, the contacts with the CIA and the FBI uh, were taken up by somebody else. Yes. Uh, on, on this matter, certainly. Obviously, matter. in my job, I attended meetings at the White House relating to foreign policy and so forth that had nothing to do with this yeah. in the meantime. But did there come a time sometime later, and could you tell us when, uh, that you had another meeting or call from Mr. John Dean? Uh, I did not have a call from Mr. John Dean. I think Mr. John Dean had gotten my message loud and clear. The next time he had business with the agency, he didn't call me. He called the new director, Dr. Schlesinger. I believe that was on the 9th of February, 1973, if I am correct. 
And Dr. Schlesinger has, I believe, submitted a memorandum for the record covering this call from Mr. Dean. I was not in Dr. Schlesinger's office when Mr. Dean called, and my only knowledge of this is the memorandum and what Dr. Schlesinger told me about, Gray's, about Dean's call. And uh, will you have a copy of that memorandum from uh, I, uh, Dr. Schlesinger's memorandum? Yes. Yes, I do. All right. Uh, let me, can I show you a copy? Uh, it's February 9, 1973, memorandum, I think, which you're referring to, and ask you if this is a correct copy. Yes, it is, and it too was made on the same poor now, all, all right. machine. Could, yes, could you uh, briefly uh, tell us what, what was the nature of that contact that uh, Mr. Dean had with uh, Mr. Schlesinger? Uh, I believe uh, he, uh, and here I go from the, uh, the Mr. Schlesinger memorandum, he uh, referred to a package of material that had been sent by the CIA to the Department of Justice in connection with the Watergate investigation. He suggested that justice be requested to return this package to the agency. The only item that would be left in justice would be a card in the files indicating that the package had been returned to the agency at its request. Since the material in the package was no longer needed for the purposes of the investigation, he indicated that the agency had originally provided these materials to the Department of Justice at the request of the Attorney General and Mr. Howard Peterson. Then he referred to some IT yes, and T-Bank, which is unrelated. Uh, although this was not your memorandum, do you know uh, what the package of materials uh, is referred to here that the um, uh, agency had given to uh, Mr. Peterson? I don't have personal knowledge of it, uh, Mr. Dash, but my understanding was it was all of the written material and I believe also the photographs that had been taken with the camera, which is why it was called a package. Uh, under what circumstances? Taken with the camera, do you... I believe when it was furnished to, after it was furnished to hunt by whoever used the camera at that time. Well, have you, were you informed by uh, Ms. Schlesinger or others that uh, this dealt with uh, the Ellsberg matter? I don't believe Mr. Schlesinger was familiar with the package. Uh, Mr. Schlesinger just, uh, incidentally, I would like to say at this point that when Mr. Schlesinger came to the agency in late January or early February, I did briefly go over these various approaches that had been made to the agency and to myself so that he was generally familiar with the background of this. I do not believe Mr. Schlesinger knew the details. I do believe that he and I agreed that for the agency to request the Department of Justice to return these materials would simply leave an arrow in the files pointing at Langley. Well, e either at that time or afterwards, have you been informed as to whether the package of materials, which you say either written materials and photographs, did deal with <coughs> the attempt to get information from um, uh, Mr. Ellsberg's uh, psychoanalyst? I really do not know, Mr. Dash. As far as I understand it, it I understood the package to mean all of the material that the agency had passed to the Department of Justice from the beginning of the inquiry, and all of the material, all of the assistance, all of the equipment that had been given to Hunt. All right, now, were you asked by Mr. Schlesinger to uh, take any action with regard to Mr. Dean's request? Mr. Dr. Schlesinger and I discussed this and agreed the request was out of the question. Dr. Schlesinger then asked me to go down and tell Mr. Dean this. And did you? I did. And could you tell us when did you uh, meet with Mr. Dean and, and have this discussion? When I called Mr. Dean, he was in Florida, and it took me quite a while to get hold of him. I left a word at his office saying that I wished to be in touch with him, and I finally got a call, and an appointment was laid on, I believe, for the 21st of February. On the 21st of February, and this is a very short memorandum. If the committee will bear with me, I'd like to read Why don't you it. read the memorandum? At the request of the director, Dr. Schlesinger, I called on Mr. John Dean at his office in the White House at 14.30, that's 2.30 in the afternoon. I explained to him that in connection with his request that the agency ask the Department of Justice to return a package of material that had been sent to them in connection with the Watergate investigation, it was quite impossible for us to return, it was quite impossible for us to request the return of this as this would simply mean that a note would be left in the Department of Justice files that the material had been sent back to the agency, and we had been asked not to destroy any material in any way related to this case. I again told him there was no agency involvement in this case and that any attempt to involve the agency in it could only be harmful to the United States. He seemed disappointed, and I left. 
Uh, General Walters, I'd like to show you a copy we have of your May 11th memorandum and ask if it's a correct copy. May I say one word about oh, this yes, memorandum, Mr. Dash? I did not write a memorandum on this oh. conversation. Uh, in early May, Dr. Schlesinger, who was having a thorough inquiry made into all the aspects of this case, asked me whether I had made a memorandum on it. I said I had not. He asked me to make one, and that is the memorandum I wrote, which was written some two months subsequently. May I show you the memorandum that you did uh, prepare on May 11, 1973? At least our copy of it, and ask you if it's a correct copy. It is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we have that memorandum appropriately uh, marked and received in evidence. Memorandum will be appropriately marked as an exhibit and received in evidence as such. Now, General Waters, did there come a time, shortly after you actually you prepared that memorandum, when you put all of the recollections you've had concerning your meetings uh, with the White House and with uh, uh, acting, uh, former acting uh, Director Gray in the form of an affidavit? Yes. Can you tell us the circumstances that led you to put your recollections of these meetings and discussions you had in the form of an affidavit? I uh, was in the Far East in early May, and when I came back, Dr. Schlesinger, in fact, Dr. Schlesinger called me back. Uh, he had asked anyone in the agency who had had any connection with this case whatsoever to write an affidavit. I did so, and those are the circumstances of the writing of the affidavit. And that affidavit uh, does include, in substance, all of the matters that you've testified here concerning your meetings uh, with the White House and with uh, Mr. Gray? To the best of my knowledge, it does. Now, I'll show you a copy that we have of your, the affidavit dated May 12, 1973, and ask you if it's a correct copy. Yes, it is a correct copy. Mr. Chairman, may we have that affidavit appropriately marked for identification and admitted in evidence? It is so altered. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. In a moment, Minority Counsel Fred Thompson will ask General Walters if the President's name was invoked in the request that he go to the FBI. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we pick up the testimony, Fred Thompson is about to question General Walters, the Deputy Director of the CIA. Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Walters, as I understand it, it was your feeling that, and it is your feeling, that on June 23rd you were being asked to, in effect, deliver a message which would, in effect, limit the Watergate investigation with regard to the Mexican part of it because of the possibility of either compromising some covert CIA activities or CIA employees. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And I, it seems to me that the crucial question is whether or not you were being told to deliver a message to limit the investigation in any other respect. Were you or were you not? I was not, Mr. Dawson. All right. Now, as of June the 23rd, did uh, you know the names of the people who had been apprehended inside the Democratic National Committee headquarters? I had read the names in the newspaper. Did you realize that uh, Mr. McCord, for example, was a former CIA employee? I believe I, I did know this, yes. Did you know Mr. McCord personally before? I did you? not. Did you realize that Mr. Hunt was a former CIA employee? Yes, I did. Uh, did you realize that Mr. Sturgis was? 
Did you realize that Mr. Martinez was still on retainer by the CIA? I don't time? believe I knew that he was still on retainer at that time. Did you know that he had been on retainer or an employee at any previous time? I believe that it came out in the discussions in the agency that these men had previously been employed by the agency. All right. Did you realize that uh, Mr. Barker had been uh, a CIA employee in the past? I believe I knew that all of these men that you mentioned. <clears throat> With regard to the Mexican aspect, is, if I remember correctly, the uh, certain checks were, in fact, funneled through, I think allegedly at this point, funneled through Mexican banks, and they wound up in the bank account of Mr. Barker in Miami. Uh, have you since understood that to be the case, I the allegations at this stage? I have since understood it, but at the time I was not aware of what the Mexican investigation was pursuing. I see, but you now realize that, uh, that there were, uh, at least according to the best of your information, that there were checks funneled through a Mexican account, which I think involved Mr. Aguirre, whose name has been mentioned, which uh, were funneled to bank account of Mr. Barker in Miami, and that some of those funds from that account, I believe, were, were taken from some of the defendants apprehended in the DNC. Is that correct? I'm aware of this in a general way. Means? I do not know the detail right. of it. But you were not aware of that at your meeting on June the 23rd? No, I was not. Go to your memorandum of uh, June the 28th, which recounts your meeting on June the 23rd. I believe you stated uh, since writing that memorandum <clears throat> in a covering note at the time, I believe this was submitted to the Senate uh, Appropriations Subcommittee, uh, dated May 18, that. Although there is a reference in your memorandum of June 28th that Mr. Haldeman said it was the President's wish that this be done, that you now believe that he did not, in fact, say that. Is that? Well, when I showed the memorandum to Mr. Helms, he said it was not his rec rec recollection that the President's name had been used. I uh, did not correct the memorandum. The memorandum was for my own personal use, and I did not use it. I did not feel strongly one way or the other about this. I'm not sure whether Mr. Haldeman has testified to whether he used it or not. Well, if you pardon me a minute, I'm scanning your covering note dated May 18th. It's, it's my understanding that as of the time you wrote the note, that uh, if you had to come down on one side or another as of that time, it was your belief that uh, he did not, in fact, say that. Would that be correct, Mr. Speaker? I think that would probably be correct. All right. Then the, then the memorandum. I, I, uh, uh, if I may, just for a second, yes. Mr. Johnson. As I say, I do not have a strong recollection one way or the other. We were in Mr. Haldeman's office, and presumably his power derived from this. I, uh, uh, Mr. Helms said he didn't recollect it. I didn't recollect it. I didn't recollect it strongly enough to challenge Mr. Helms. I accepted Mr. Helms saying that, no, he did not. Well, Mr. Haldeman it. has testified that this that's matter right. was discussed with the president, so that's, that's right. not really an issue. It's really a matter of memory, I think. And I did not feel strongly enough to challenge Mr. Helms' uh, statement that he did not recall the name. You believe also that, uh, according to your testimony this morning, that the discussion of bail occurred on uh, on uh, Tuesday, Tuesday the 27th. Tuesday the 27th, yes. and I believe you have it here in your conversation, uh, the 26th. That's that correct. correct. So that would be an error in that regard. I had straightened it out in my affidavit. Yes, sir. I, I understand. Let me ask you this: When uh, you had this conversation on the 23rd. What time of day was it? I believe it was 1.30 in the afternoon. 1.30? It was you... postponed. I recall that it was postponed uh, either an hour or half an hour. Right. And then you had your meeting later that same afternoon with Mr. Gray? Uh, about an hour later. At 2.30, I believe, according to your memorandum. Do you recall about how long your meeting lasted with uh, Hallman and Erlingman? 10, 15 minutes. Right. Did you go directly from your meeting with Haldeman and Ehrlichman to uh, your meeting with Mr. Gray? And I think I've justified already, Mr. Thompson. I don't really remember what I did. 
I don't think I would have had time to go back to the office. I know I separated from Mr. Helms at this point, and he went back to the office. Where, I, where is the CIA office? It's way out at Langley. It's eight or nine miles out of Washington. You would have had to go on back eight or nine miles, travel back in eight yes, or nine miles to the Justice Department. Yes. As I recall, I just uh, killed time downtown in Washington. All right. Do you remember around the states here that upon leaving the White House, I discussed the matter briefly with the director. Upon returning to the office, I called Gravy and indicated there was a matter of some emergency, and he agreed to see me at 2.30. So that evidently was, is incorrect. Would that be it? I would say it was perhaps incorrect. I can't guarantee that it's incorrect. I may have driven straight out and called from the office and driven straight back. What uh, was your normal practice with regard to uh, following up meetings or the particular events which uh, you participated in with memoranda? When I was uh, an interpreter, I wrote long memoranda, Mr. Thompson. Since I have been at CIA, generally there was someone else present who makes note on the meetings. These are the only memoranda of the record, I think, almost that I wrote since I've been with the CIA. These that you submitted to us are the only ones that you've written since you've been there? That's right. I noticed that uh, the uh, memoranda of, of the June 23rd meeting <clears throat> was not written until June 28th. Is that correct? That is correct. But when you started writing memoranda, they, they became very prompt, I noticed, on the uh, July, July 5th meeting. Uh, well, first of all, the June, the June 28th meeting, you wrote up June the 29th. July 5th meeting, you wrote the same day. July 6th meeting, you wrote the same day. July 12th meeting, you wrote the next day, the 13th. The July 28th meeting, you wrote the same day. Uh, what, uh, what caused you to start systematically writing memoranda of the events that were taking place? Mr. Dean's exploration of whether the agency could produce bail and pay the salaries of the defendants while they were in jail. You refer in your memorandum, memorandum dated July 6, 1972, you did not see why he, referring to Gray, or I should jeopardize the integrity of our organizations to protect some mid-level White House figures who had acted imprudently. Who were you referring to? I don't think we had anybody specific in mind. I certainly didn't know who might be behind this. Well, who, would, who were you dealing with who you might consider mid-level the White House? The middle-level figure, I would say, would be Mr. Dean, but he, there may have been other middle-level figures. I did not know who these middle-level middle figures might be. I did not know who was behind this. Did you consider Haldeman middle-level? No. What, uh, what was your feeling with regard to Mr. Dean when you were dealing with him, when you were talking about uh, uh, these matters uh, with him? At which point in the conversation, Mr. Thompson? Well, start from the beginning. Start with the uh, first meeting you had with him on the 26th, and, and tell us what your what your thoughts were based upon those conversations. Well, I as thought, you as you began to meet with him, what his interest might be. Well, I first of all was struck by his insistence that the agency was in some way involved. Uh, he pursued this with, well, it couldn't have been without your knowing it, and isn't there some way, and it must have been, and look, all these people used to work for the CIA, and so forth and so on. This is the first thing that struck me, his insistence on trying to drag us into it, which made me think that he was exploring this uh, option, which is what made me tell him that I would resign rather than have the agency participate in any attempt to stifle this. Did you conclude in your own mind that possibly that uh, some of the people directly involved might be working for some of Mr. Dean's friends who were intermediaries? This thought did cross my mind. We better have any further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Montagna. General Walters, you indicated that uh, <clears throat> you and other witnesses have similarly indicated that uh, certain memoranda with respect to the investigation in-house at CIA 
was given to the FBI. Am I correct in that statement? Yes, Senator. Would you tell us what uh, was in that uh, particular memoranda or in any other communications to the FBI? I believe that most of these memoranda, Senator, referred to matters that had occurred before I came to work at the agency. Uh, there are, I believe, several memoranda in the possession. The memorandum, for instance, which I gave Mr. Gray on the 6th, uh, contains a recapitulation of the various uh, pieces of information we have been steadily sending to the FBI, I believe, since the 20th of June. Uh, in capsule form, what did this memoranda indicate? I believe it indicated uh, Hunt's call of the agency, the equipment that had been furnished to him, and so forth. What kind of an investigation did you conduct in-house after you were called to the White House for this conference with Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman? I talked to the people in the agency who were responsible for operations in Mexico, and it was through them that I received the assurance that the FBI inquiries in Mexico would not jeopardize or compromise any of the CIA's operations in that area. What kind of uh, investigation did you conduct with respect to the possible background and possible connection of the defendants who had been arrested at the Watergate? I believe that Mr. Helms ordered the, our security and personnel people to provide all necessary information to the Department of Justice and the FBI. To the, I'm sorry, to the FBI on this. And uh, did you, as a result of this investigation, uncover the fact that Eugenio Martinez uh, was on retainer at that time. I believe we did, Senator. And uh, did you communicate this to the Department of Justice and to people in the White House? Uh, I personally did not. Uh, a great deal of communication was going on, Senator, between our personnel and security people and the Department of Justice and the FBI. Whether it was communicated to the White House or not, I am not in a position to answer. Were there any communications with respect to this investigation uh, delivered to the White House? I am not aware of any, sir. Why did you uh, omit this, due to the fact that you had uh, been in contact with Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Haldeman, and Mr. Dean? Did, didn't you feel that the White House should know about uh, the uh, uh, possible involvement of a man on retainer to CIA by the name of Eugenio Martinez? I believe that the FBI was being kept fully informed, and I believe that the FBI would keep the White House informed in the pursuit of this investigation. Uh, now, I'm not trying to um, cross you up or anything like that, uh, General Walters. I'm really asking you to uh, see if you can recall whether or not anyone in CIA communicated with anyone in the White House with respect to the in-house investigation and what you uncovered with respect to these individuals. I personally have no knowledge of any such communication, sir. Uh -huh. The FBI was the investigating body, and as I understand it, all the information that became available to us was furnished to them. Now, with respect to uh, your conversations with Mr. Gray, was there any mention made uh, in your conversations with him that uh, possibly the information which you were imparting to him might be communicated to the White House? No, sir, I don't believe, I, did, I thought it would be inappropriate for me to try and tell Mr. Gray how to run his agency. Now, as you look back to the conversations starting on June the 23rd, and the subsequent conversations uh, with White House people, including Mr. Dean, is it your feeling, as you look at this thing in retrospect, that uh, the White House, those individuals with whom you talked, were trying to use you for some ulterior motive? Uh, I would say I must draw a distinction between the two contacts I had, the 
two different people in the White House. As I've testified earlier, I had no reason to doubt that Mr. Haldeman might not have information to which I was not privy, that the further conduct of the investigation in Mexico might jeopardize covert agency activities. Are you, be I, are you being charitable there, uh, General? Senator, I don't believe so. As I testified earlier, if I had thought that Mr. Haldeman was asking me to do something that was improper, I would have made the same threat to resign to him that I did to Mr. Dean the first time Mr. Dean made a suggestion I consider was improper. Uh, how did you interpret the mandate which he gave you to go to Mr. Gray and to tell Mr. Gray, when he had no information, to tell, for you to tell Mr. Gray that uh, an FBI investigation in Mexico might endanger CIA activities. I interpreted this as meaning that Mr. Haldeman had some information which I did not have. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to go back to this time and say that the idea of impropriety or improper actions, I had no reason to doubt the word of a very senior official of the United States government. Did you think at that moment, uh, by asking him what his background information might be, uh, as a premise for the directive or mandate which he had given you? No, sir, I did not. Uh, had you thought about it since? <laughs> Obviously, there's no sight like hindsight. But given the relative nature of our positions, I, I still have somewhat of a feeling of, uh, that it might have been inappropriate to ask him. The White House bears a great responsibility. Why would do things other people do not? Well, why would it have been inappropriate, uh, General? Why? Sir, if in all our dealings with the White House we doubted what they told us, we would, we would have a very difficult time. I did not feel it was appropriate to ask him because I did not think there was anything in, in, in improper. Well, on June the 23rd, you had been reading the newspapers. You knew that some of these people were involved uh, uh, with the committee to re-elect the president and that they had been arrested, they were in jail, and uh, that they had uh, connections with, uh, previous connections with CIA. Uh, you, knew, you knew the whole context, and uh, still you did not think of asking for some kind of clarification with respect to the mandate which had been delivered to you by Mr. Haldeman? Sir, Mr. Haldeman indicated to me that he might have information which I did not have. What I would really have been asking him is White House sources, how he'd found something out. Had I asked him where he got this information from? Uh, did you, uh, in your conference with Mr. Gray, try to develop a dialogue with respect to possible reasons that the White House might have in uh, giving you this directive? No, sir. I transmitted the message to Mr. Gray. He made some reference to some people whose names meant nothing to me, like Ogario and Dahlberg. Uh, Mr. Uh, or General Walters, in view of the experience of CIA in this, in this particular matter and the attempts made by some people at the White House to involve CIA in uh, tasks which were ultra-virus or outside of the scope of the agency, uh, what recommendations do you have to make to this committee uh, so that this might not occur in the future. Senator, I think it would really be presumptuous of me to try and tell this committee what legislation uh, could be effective in this respect. I must, however, associate myself with what Mr. Helms said in reply to your question yesterday, Senator, that I don't know how you legislate honesty and decency. You've got to pick the right people for these jobs above all else. There is obviously some legislation that could be effective but I think the most important thing is the selection of the right people for positions of trust. Well, do you feel that uh, there should be some uh, provision in, uh, in the law governing CIA requiring uh, the director or deputy director or any other employee to report to an oversight committee in the Congress when uh, someone in the executive department or any other department tries to use CIA for political purposes? That could be one solution to prevent a recurrence, Senator, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, General. That's all the questions I have.
There's a vote on in the Senate, so we'll have to suspend until the members of the committee can get over and vote and return. Today's floor action dealt with ratifying treaties. The committee recessed briefly and then returned to allow Sam Dash and then Lowell Weicker to question General Walters. come to order. I'm informed by counsel that Senator Montoya had finished except he wanted to have read into the record a memorandum and without objection I'll let counsel read that memorandum and I'll then recognize Senator Weicker. Uh, uh, Gen General Waters, uh, I understand uh, Senator Montoya had asked you about when uh, the um, CIA informed the FBI uh, concerning the uh, uh, employment uh, of Mr. Martinez. And uh, I understand you've been shown a copy of the memorandum uh, to, uh, for the acting director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, attention, Mr. Arnold L. Parnum, uh, subject, uh, uh, Mr. Martinez, uh, from um, uh, the uh, director of security. Mr. Osborne. Yes. All right, now, Mr. Osborne. Uh, now, let me, I'd like to read that in the record, which would indicate that there was on an updated. Uh, I think June 20, 1972. Uh, Mr. Martinez was born on 8 July 1922 in um, um, Xerox, but it looked like Artemia. Uh, a R T E M I, and I think it's S A. Uh, Pino del Rio, Cuba. And he is a naturalized United States citizen. He was educated at the University of, of Havana and he has a B.S. degree. He also has two years additional work in the School of Medicine, previously married to a Cuban from whom he is divorced. Mr. Martinez is currently married to a United States citizen. Uh, Mr. Martinez was recruited by the agency in January 1961 in connection with Cuban operations. The project to which he was assigned was terminated in 1969. Since that time, Mr. Martinez has been on a part-time retainer to report on the Cuban exile community. In connection with this activity, he was last uh, met on June 6, 1972, and has been unable to be contacted since June 14, 1972. For these part-time activities, Mr. Martinez has received uh, a retainer of $100 per month uh, since 1969. Prior to that time, he received $8,100 per year for his full-time operational activity. It is to be noted that Mr. Martinez is a real estate partner of Mr. Bernard L. Barker. The above information is for use on, on, only and should not be disseminated outside your bureau. Please transmit any information on this matter uh, to the attention of the Director of Security. Uh, and you have seen that memorandum and uh, just, yes, just prior to your returning to testify. And I think in part it answers one of the questions yes. Senator Montoya asked me. Senator Weichel. Well, can I ask counsel, because I'm quite interested in that. Now, either counsel or General Walters, when was this information um, acquired and was it transmitted to the Federal Bureau of Investigation? I believe this is a letter transmitting it to the Federal Bureau of Investigation on the 20th of June, 1972. That is three days after the break-in, Senator. Well, that's fine. I, I'm not uh, disputing it. I, as a matter of fact, it's just one of the questions that I had in the back of my mind is what did the CIA do insofar as these persons were concerned? And I would gather that you went right to work in investigating the status of these various people. And this is, what, the 20th of June? Is, this, is that the date on this? Yeah, 20 June 1972. That's within, what, three days of the break-in. The CIA had completed. Is this, had all the other individuals also been investigated by that time? 
Uh, I don't believe the investigation. I think it was an ongoing project, uh, Senator. I believe I testified earlier that starting on June 20th, we began feeding to the FBI as fast as we acquired any information on any of the defendants or anybody in any way connected with this matter. I think it's a very important point as far as the agency is concerned that it did its job and did it pretty darn fast uh, uh, so that uh, 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 insofar as those persons that have been ex, and, uh, with the exception of Mr. Martinez, everybody else was an ex-CIA agent. Well, I'm not saying they all were, but they were not in the employ of the CIA. Is that correct? That is, Senator. If I may make a minor distinction, only two of them uh, Hunt and McCord had ever been CIA full-time employees. And the others were contract employees for a short duration or a longer duration. You and I could make that distinction, I think, in the minds of the American public. A uh, contractor full-time really wouldn't make any difference. But in any event, uh, the rest of the personnel, with the exception of Mr. Martinez, had left the CIA, were no longer in the employ of the CIA uh, at the time of the break-in except for Mr. Martinez, who was, a, who was on a retainer contract, or whichever term you want to go ahead and use. Now, um, and yet, I gather your investigation still did include, since they had been ex-employees, either full-time or contract, these other individuals. Is that true? As I understand it, Mr. Helms directed our personnel and security people to communicate all information available on these people to the FBI. And by the time the 20th rolls around, the one person that was on a part-time basis, even a report on him, had been sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I believe the agency made a very genuine effort to cooperate with the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Sir. So that it was, it was with, it was, it was with some basis of fact arrived at after investigation that when Mr. Helms talked to the director on the 22nd and said that there is no CIA involvement, he just wasn't pulling something out of the air. I mean, he had some facts before him. Isn't that, is that correct? My experience with Mr. Helms, he never pulls things out of the air, Senator. Right. And when you walked in on the 23rd uh, uh, and with the director, uh, you were cogniz cognizant of these investigations that they had been going on. I had not seen this particular memorandum. I knew that these people had been former CIA employees, and I knew that we were furnishing all available information on them to the Department of Justice. But I, again, I want to repeat the importance, I think, of what's being stated here, because I'm, and the impressions that we give, I think, are, are equally important to the, to the facts that this committee elicits, that I think there might have been an impression left that in the meeting of the 23rd, when you and the director sit down with Mr. Holliman and Mr. Ehrlichman and state that there's no CIA involvement, that this, as I've said, it just wasn't something that, that uh, you were saying categorically without knowledge that the agency itself had gone into this matter in the previous days. I believe Mr. Helms said, was talking on the basis of what he knew on that day on the 23rd and the result of all of these which were communicated to him. Have you ever counted up, incidentally, I thought about this when, when you were testifying between you and the director, how many times in this, in this period did you say there is no CIA involvement uh, to various individuals? Have you, have you counted it up? Uh, Couldn't possibly count it. It was Mr. Helm stated yesterday with some warmth. It needs constant repeating. Well, I think it does need constant repeating. Uh, we know that the director turned to Acting Director Gray and said there is no CIA involvement on the 22nd. And I gather in the meeting on the 23rd, it was made again clear, both by yourself and the director, to Mr. Holliman and Mr. Ehrlichman, there is no CIA involvement. Now, I gather when you met with Mr. Dean, you were very forceful, as I would imagine here, they're saying it in a variety of ways, there is no CIA involvement. Now, let me... Uh, And I gather the, the, the final chapter in there is no CIA involvement being transmitted, uh, and this is only as to the knowledge that you acquired from Mr. Gray, and we'll have Mr. Gray before us later on, to the president, actually. Is that correct? 
Sir, I did not have any personal contact with the President. No. I'm saying, in your recollection of the conversation, or your conversation with Mr. Gray, where he reported to you, where, yes, he, I, where he reported to I, you. I, would, I could only assume that he had told that to the President. All right. Now, let's go to June the 23rd in your memor memorandum. <clears throat> Because I do have some questions as to uh, uh, statements made in that. First part there where you described the beginning of the meeting on June 23rd at 1 o'clock, called with Director Helms on John Ehrlichman, Robert Haldeman, and Ehrlichman's office at the White House. Haldeman said the bugging affair at the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate apartments had made a lot of noise and that the Democrats are trying to maximize it. The FBI had been called in and was investigating the matter. The investigation was leading to a lot of important people, and this could get worse. He asked what the connection with the agency was, and the director repeated that there was none. Haldeman said the whole affair was getting embarrassing. And it was the President's wish that Walters call on Acting Director L. Patrick Gray and suggest to him that since the five suspects had been arrested, this should be sufficient, and that it was not advantageous to have the inquiry pushed, especially in Mexico, et cetera. Now, my question, my question to you is, Right at that point, I can, don't you consider this to be a rather strange conversation for, for CIA officials to be involved in? I mean, with the exception of that one sentence, he asked what the connection with the agency was, and the director repeated there was none. All the rest of those three paragraphs deal with a political situation here in the United States. It has nothing to do with the CIA. I mean, didn't it occur to you at that time that this was a rather strange conversation for you to be involved in? Uh, um, it, it more, sounds more to me like a meeting of the Republican National Committee than a meeting of the, 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 the CIA. And did this occur to you that this was a rather strange subject for us to be sitting around here talking about? In my mind, there was a distinction between the agency being involved in the sense of having had any participation in the operation against the Democratic National Committee. What I understood Mr. Haldeman to be referring to with CIA activities outside the United States. But I know, but that's not the context of these comments. This is strictly, it, it is focusing on, this is an embarrassing political situation. The investigation is leading to important people. All of them said the whole affair is getting embarrassing, and it was the President's wish that Walters call on Acting Director Patrick Gray and suggest to him that since the five suspects had been arrested, this should be sufficient. Well, I may not have been complete enough. As I stated at the outset, this is not the totality of what is said. He gave these general considerations, and then the concern he expressed was that the FBI investigation in Mexico might jeopardize some assets or some activity of the CIA. Uh, he was talking in a philosophical sense about what had happened in the United States. And then the other part that I understood referred to the possibility of compromise of CIA assets or personnel outside the United States. All right. So you leave the meeting, and um, as Director Helm said yesterday, and I'd uh, like to ask you whether you had the same feeling, that, that he frankly was uneasy with uneasy with uh, what, with the orders that had been given to you from Mr. Hollow, and that he stated yesterday, I'm trying to paraphrase his testimony, that he suggested to you that you might call on Gray and indicate to him the normal arrangements as between the FBI and the CIA, and that was quite sufficient. Do you recall any such conversation? I recall such a conversation, but I do not recall it as being quite as limitative as Mr. Helms uh, mentioned yesterday. At no time did he tell me that I was not to deliver the message I had been given to deliver. He did emphasize that I should remind Mr. Gray of this agreement between the CIA and the FBI not to interfere with one another's operation. So now you, you go to the director, the acting director, and you state 
to him, I repeated that if the investigation were pushed south of the border, it would trespass on some of the, our covert projects, and in view of the fact that the five men involved were under arrest, it would best to taper off the matter there. Now General Walters, and I, I'm trying to phrase this as best I can, because I certainly believe you to, meet it, to be a man of integrity, uh, uh, and I think your career speaks for that. This wasn't really exactly this, this, this concept that you left with the acting director really wasn't the truth, was it? I had no way of knowing, sir. I presume Mr. Haldeman had information that I did not have, that something in this investigation would uncover assets of the CIA. I had been with the CIA six weeks at this time. I did not know the details of its operations in Mexico. Mr. Haldeman was a very well-informed man, close to the top of the American structure of government. I had no reason to doubt him. I had no reason to doubt any of the senior people in government with whom I was talking at this stage of affairs. Well, all right, then may I just ask you this question. When you said this to Mr. Gray, did you say to Mr. Gray, Mr. Haldeman has told me to tell you these facts, or did you deliver this to Mr. Gray as if this were your own idea? I believe, to the best of my recollection, Senator, that I told him that I had come, to the, come from the White House, that I had talked to some senior people there, and I then proceeded to deliver this message to him. But as Mr. Gray sees you standing before him as the representative of the, and uh, the assistant director of the uh, CIA, would he have every right to believe that, that this was the opinion of the CIA or, or that this was coming from the White House? I believe that he had the right to think that the message that I gave to him that this could jeopardize assets of the CIA was essentially correct. And at what point in time did you disabuse Mr. Gray of this concept that you had left with him on the 23rd of June? Directly on the 6th of July. However, on the next working day, this was a Friday evening, on the Monday, I told Mr. Dean, who I was informed was in charge of this whole matter, that there was no agency involvement, that this would not jeopardize any activities of the agency. As I stated earlier, perhaps naively, I believed Mr. Dean would tell him since they were obviously in contact with one another. In retrospect, I should certainly have called Mr. Gray and told him myself. Now, do you, uh, I, I want to get back to the basis of the belief that Mr. Haldeman would know something about the operations of the CIA that you and the director didn't know. I find that to be rather, un rather unusual. I'm not saying that there are things in the White House in a broad general way, in, in the way of policy, that they wouldn't know uh, uh, or that wouldn't be in your knowledge and would be in theirs. But as far as the actual operations of the CIA, is there anything that you feel the White House knows that you don't know, you and the director? We could, no we could know if we went into it. But there are cases where the White House is sometimes supported or something is done for them in foreign countries by members of the CIA. And uh, it would be awkward for me and to go into details. The knowledge, and without the knowledge of the CIA? Well, I think if it's clearly evident that it's coming from the White House, uh, at least at this time, uh, I, I, without the knowledge is difficult to say without the knowledge of the CIA. This is why I felt someone in the CIA might know and why I checked with the geographic people. Well, then there's my last question is very simply this. Is it possible for Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman to give direction to a CIA agent without the director, the assistant director, knowing that? To give instructions, I don't believe so, sir. Senator Talmadge. General Walters, for how long and in what capacity have you known President Nixon? I have known President Nixon, I believe, Senator, since 1957. As I testified earlier, I served as his interpreter 
during a trip he made through eight countries in South America. Subsequently, I saw him only on the anniversary of the stoning in Caracas where the car was attacked with, by a mob. He used to give a party during the time, in the remaining years he was vice president, he used to give a party once a year. I went to that. In the uh, years between Mr. Nixon's departure from the White House and his re-election as president, I saw him perhaps three times in those eight or nine or whatever it was years. After Mr. Nixon became president, I accompanied him on two trips around Europe. Uh, I saw him on an occasional basis. As I have testified earlier, I have not seen Mr. Nixon privately to talk to since the 2nd of May, 1972, when he swore me in as deputy director of the agency. I've had one phone call with him in that uh, time frame. He called me for something concerning his trip to Moscow. Nothing say, else was discussed. Would you say that your relationship was personal as well as professional? Uh, I would say yes, Senator. When you shared the kind of danger that I mentioned this morning, there is a certain element, but I would like to bring out that I have also served as interpreter to President Truman, to President Johnson, and to President Eisenhower. We've had some testimony, General, before the committee here that the White House was making efforts to make all the agencies more responsive to the White House. Would you say that your appointment as Deputy Director of the CIA was an effort to make that agency more responsive to the White House? Uh, I would say, Senator, that normally a president appoints people, presidential appointees, because he, he has confidence in them. There has been some testimony that I have heard to the effect that someone had said that I was put in the agency in order to influence agency policy. In all fairness, I would like to say that with the single exception of the events about which I am testifying today, no one in the White House, the President or anyone else, has ever sought to influence agency policy through me. I'm told that you have a very outstanding background for the position that you hold. Is it true you speak eight different languages? Yes, Senator, it is. I'm also told that on one occasion when the President was in France, when you were there, his military had a shake, that he made a 15-minute speech. You listened to it and repeated it verbatim in French. Is that correct? That's very flattering, but I doubt if it was verbatim, Senator. I wondered if your memory was that phenomenal. Now, General, there's one very important point here in your testimony. I don't know whether it's escaped the attention of others, but it's important from my standpoint. You have a memo dated here, July the 13th, 1972. And in that memo, do you have it before you? You read it into the record, I believe. It's on the occasion that the President called Mr. Gray to congratulate him on the FBI action which had frustrated the aircraft hijacking in San Francisco. And I pick up your exact language at that point. The President asked him, referring to Gray, if he had talked to me about the case, period. What case are you referring to? The Watergate that? case, I Watergate. would presume, sir. That was my understanding of it. I had assumed that that was uh, what you had reference to in this memo. Gray replied that he had. That meant that you and Gray had conferred, of course, about the Watergate case, and Gray at that point, the director of the FBI, was reporting that fact to the President of the United States. Is that that was my understanding from what Mr. Gray told me. All right. Me. Go on down further now. The President then asked him what his recommendation was on the matter. Gray had replied that the case could not be covered up and would lead quite high and that he felt that the President should get rid of the people that were involved. Any attempt to involve the FBI or the CIA in this case would only prove a mortal wound, and you say that was your words, and would achieve nothing. The President then said, then, and I'm quoting direct the President now, I should get rid of whoever is involved no matter how high. Gray replied, that was his recommendation. The President then asked what I thought, meaning you, and Gray said my views were the same as his. The President took it well and thanked Gray. 
Later that day, Gray had talked to Dean and repeated the conversation to him. Dean said, okay. Is that a correct verbatim quotation from your statement? Yes. That is a correct uh, verbatim quotation, uh, Senator, but as I added earlier, I do recollect, I did not put it in the memorandum, Gray saying that the president had told him to go ahead with his investigation. Mm -hmm. Now, am I, to, am I to conclude from that that at that point, and that was July, early July, 1972, the president of the United States had the opinion of the acting director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency that there was something going on wrong in the White House staff and he ought to correct it. This is my assumption from my recollection of what Mr. Gray told me. That would be my conclusion from reading your remarks here. Now, am I to assume from your testimony that you felt that these repeated efforts from the White House staff on the part of Haldeman and Ehrlichman and subsequently Mr. Dean when they tried to get you involved in a cover-up against your best judgment, against your own will, that it was an effort on the White House staff's part to get you and Mr. Gray, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, to act in concert to cover up this case? Uh, Senator, I would like to draw a distinction between the three people you have mentioned. Yes. As I have testified earlier, I believed at the time that Mr. Haldeman asked me to go to see Mr. Gray, that he did have, or could have, some information. Mr. Ehrlichman, as I recall it, in all fairness, did not take part in this conversation. My first conversation with Dean on the 26th made me suspicious. When he asked me whether the agency could pay bail on the salary of these people when they were in jail, I became convinced that I, the option of doing something improper was being explored. I would remind, however, that I had no further conversation with Mr. Ehrlichman or Mr. Haldeman at any time after the 23rd of uh, June. So there was really a differentiation in what the three people were asking me to do. As I have said before, if I had thought Mr. Haldeman was asking me to do something improper, I wouldn't have done it. Yes, I'm certain you would not have, sir. There's one final thing I would like to ask you, sir. You have been on a professional basis with the President of the United States as well as a personal basis. You saw what was happening in his staff to get two of the most important uh, agencies in the United States involved in obstruction of justice. Why didn't you, sir, ask for an appointment with the President and go over and tell him frankly what was happening? Sir, I felt that would have been circumventing my channels. I reported it to my superior, Mr. Helms, and I reported it to the acting director of the FBI. You didn't think you should go higher than that? If I had been pushed, if I had been told to do something improper, I would have. I made this quite plain to Dean. He was exploring with me. I made quite plain to him from the very first meeting that if he attempted to order or direct me to implicate the agency in any way, I would resign and I would go and tell the president. And I didn't hear much from Mr. Dean after that. You've had a long and distinguished career in the Army now. You saw something going on as a first lieutenant that you knew was absolutely inherently wrong and ought to be corrected. Would you ever have occasion to bypass the, the captain and go see the major in an effort to get it corrected? If I saw something going on wrong, I believe I would, Senator. But I must repeat that what Mr. Dean was asking me to do, he wasn't asking me, it was all tentative exploration. Yes. Had Mr. Dean at any time ordered me to do something improper, I would have asked to see the president. I'm not talking about that. There's no reflection whatever on your conduct, General. I commend you for it. You were asked to get involved in the obstruction of justice, and you didn't do it. But you did know that some of the closest confidants and advisors to the president of the United States were involved in that conspiracy, and you didn't inform the president. Why not? I don't quite take the assumption, same assumption on the question that you do, Senator, but I will try and answer it. Uh, first of all, to go back to the climate of this time, the agency was under attack with various unjustified accusations. My interviews with Mr. Dean were alone. It was his word against mine. If I had gone out and simply accused him of trying to involve me in something and he'd said no, 
the environment in the United States at that time would not necessarily have been favorable to my unsupported word. I would have simply involved the agency in further publicity in support of something I could not prove other than by my statement. General, and my, over Excuse me. my overwhelming concern, the Senator, at this time as it is today, is because I believe that an effective CIA is essential to the United States. Had I gotten us involved in a Donnybrook, which I couldn't prove other than by my unsupported word, I would not have served the purpose that I was attempting to serve. General, I have no further questions. I want to compliment you on your long and distinguished service to your country and your absolute candor in testifying before this committee. Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Gurney. In a moment, Senator Gurney will ask if General Walters was requested or ordered to go see the FBI director. Public television coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, ANPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back to the hearings, it's Senator Gurney's turn to question General Walters. Senator Gurney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, there are two <coughs> different versions about uh, what Mr. Haldeman said to you at that first meeting. In your memo, and I read from the memo, it says, <clears throat> Holloman then stated, I could tell Gray that I had talked to the White House and suggested that the investigation not be pushed further. In <clears throat> your testimony before the Appropriations Committee, you had this to say, and this is from the record of the Appropriations Committee. Mr. Haldeman said this. It has been decided that you, Walters, will go to Mr. Gray and tell him that if the investigation of the Mexican finance part of this thing is pursued, it may uncover some CIA assets. Now, that is somewhat different. Which order did he actually give you, or what did he say to you? Senator, being a lesser man than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I also occasionally... Uh, that thing. I, would, I do not, in retrospect, and thinking it back and refreshing my memory, I do not recall him mentioning money. I, I'm not trying to trip you up, General. Please believe. But there is a tremendous difference between these two versions. One version is that Haldeman is ordering you to order the FBI to stop. The other one is to inform the FBI that if they pursue this Mexican uh, money business that it may uncover some CIA assets, and those are two diametrically different things. Uh, my best recollection, Senator, as I see it, was that the pursuit of this investigation in Mexico, in Mexico, and limited only to Mexico, could endanger CIA assets. Whether the money aspect came into my mind, because Gray mentioned it when I talked to him, which was prior to my testimony before the House Appropriations Committee, but long subsequent to the memorandum I wrote, I would rather, in this case, trust the memorandum I wrote five days later than a testimony I might have given a long time later influenced by what I knew subsequently that the Mexican thing involved money. Uh, quite presently, my, real, my recollection is that money specifically was not mentioned. Well, that really isn't the thing that I'm talking about. The money is kind of incidental here. What I'm talking about is whether Mr. Haldeman directed you to go to the FBI and tell them not to, let's use your own words here, uh, push the investigation further. That is correct, Senator. Now that, that really is ordering the FBI to stop. The other one uh, is saying to the FBI that if you pursue something in Mexico, whether it's money or anything else, that's unimportant, that it may interfere with the CIA. And one of the reasons why this is so important and why I'm asking it is that one version 
the version you gave before the Appropriations Committee uh, coincides, I think, with what the President told uh, Haldeman to do. The other one in your memorandum uh, coincides more with what apparently was going on in the White House uh, that we've learned before this committee here in these last several weeks, and that was a cover-up. That's uh, why it's important to get this thing pinned down if we can. The only thing I can tell you, Senator, is to the best of my recollection, at the present time, in all the light of what I know, I was told you will go to Mr. Gray and you will tell him that if the investigation in Mexico is pushed further, it may, I didn't say stop, it may uncover some CIA assets. Well, <laughs> that coincides more with the testimony that you gave before the Appropriations Committee and less with your memorandum here. Now then, after you finish this <laughs> meeting with Haldeman and Ehrlichman, you and Director Helms, you mentioned that you left the meeting and you chatted together for a moment, and Mr. Helms uh, reminded you uh, to tell Pat Gray that there was a rapport between the two agencies. Yes, sir. But didn't you and Director Helms uh, discuss this very unusual meeting and this very unusual order? Here, here is is Haldeman, the, the presidential assistant, ordering you to go to the FBI and instruct them to do something and not do something. Didn't you and the director discuss that unusual I think meeting? We, I think we both felt that Mr. Haldeman might have some information to which we were not privy. Well, did you ask him? Did I ask who, sir? Mr. Haldeman. I did not ask Mr. Haldeman what information he might have. I felt that if he wanted me to know, he would have told me. But isn't the mission of the CIA to find out for the President, as well as the Defense Department, the State Department, and any other interested agencies, all manner of foreign intelligence that may be dangerous or detrimental to the United States? I believe that is the general mission of the agency, yes. Who would in this government be better uh, able uh, to have that kind of information than Mr. Helms and General Walters. We would have, sir, once we had access to our sources on this matter. The CIA is quite a large agency, and I do not believe that Mr. Helms, after six years, and I certainly after six weeks, did not know the details of all the agency operations in Mexico. I wouldn't expect that either, General, and, and I'm not really talking about that. I'm, I'm saying that it strikes me as though you might have been curious and said, Mr. Holloman, what are we doing down in Mexico that you're afraid is going to be interrupted? Perhaps in retrospect I should have, sir, but the nature of the direction that was given to me was quite explicit. Well, but that impresses me, too. It, it was extremely explicit, and uh, I wonder why there wasn't some question of it or some further inquiry by either you or Director Helms there of Mr. Holloman. Sir, as soon as I talked to Mr. Gray, I went back to the agency and attempted to check up to see whether this was a fact or not. You mentioned also that <clears throat> I think it was in this first meeting or maybe one of the dean meetings. No, it was the first meeting. The investigation was leading to a lot of important people. Who were these important people? I was not told, sir. Did you ask? No, sir. Did Director Helms ask? I do not believe he did. In a later meeting with Dean, I think that was the 27th, Dean uh, said that some of these suspects might talk. Uh, talk about what? I thought he was telling me they might talk and involve the CIA, and it didn't worry me one iota because I knew that there was nothing they could say which would involve the CIA. It didn't occur to you that he might be saying that they might talk and involve somebody in the government other than the CIA? No, sir, that was not the understanding I had of it. The understanding I had was they might talk and involve the CIA. Maybe in the committee to reelect the president? My understanding was that it referred to us, sir, that it was a veiled form of a threat. Didn't occur to you it might be people in the White House? Well, by the time I had my meeting... They might talk about people who were in the White House. This thought did cross my mind, yes, sir. Did you ask him? No, I did not.
This business about the letter from the CIA to the FBI, uh, that the FBI should not go ahead with this investigation because it might compromise security interests. Uh, who, who asked the agency to write a letter to the FBI? On the 5th of July, Senator Pat Gray called me and said, I can't stop this unless I get a letter from you or the director from Helms or from you saying that the further pursuit of this investigation in Mexico will jeopardize CIA assets. That was the first mention of it. Did he uh, indicate that somebody had asked him to talk to you and ask for a letter? I do not have any recollection of that, uh, Senator. Did you ask him? No. It, it was your impression that he, he was going ahead and only that could stop him from going ahead. That, that was my that impression, was Senator. Uh, I, I won't repeat the question that Senator Talmadge asked. I had it here to ask myself uh, about the long association with the president and <clears throat> all of these very unusual events that occurred between the White House people and CIA and the FBI that would certainly uh, lead to indicate that all was not well uh, in these requests made of you, and of course you realized then you didn't do anything about it. And I share uh, Senator Talmadge's uh, uh, feeling that uh, you acted properly. I do indeed, and I don't want to question that. But I, and I want to ask you why you didn't go to the president. He already has done that. But did you ever discuss this with Director Helms and say, now, Mr. Helms, uh, all this is going on here. Something really must be very strange. Do you think that we ought to advise the president? Did you ever discuss that with Mr. Helms? I don't think we did, uh, Senator. I think one of the reasons for that, which is difficult to see in retrospect, is this was compressed in a very short period of time. The whole span of this was from the 23rd to the 28th in a period of five days. After that, after I told Dean that if he pushed me any further, I would go to the president, I never heard from him again. Yes, and, and I can understand that, and that occurred to me also. But then in February of the next year, here comes a call from Mr. Dean saying, now there's some material over there in the, CI, in, in the FBI that you gave the FBI, CIA gave the FBI. Uh, I want you, that is the CIA, to request that material to be returned to you. And simply a card put in there with that advice that it had been returned without any reference to what the material was. Uh, now, what did you think Mr. Dean was trying to do then? Well, as I, you will recall, Senator, he called Dr. Schlesinger, not me. I thought that he was trying to, as I put it, leave an arrow in the Department of Justice files pointing at Langley. But again, didn't that uh, occur to you and uh, Director Schlesinger? And I do remember now the call was to him. But you and he discussed it. And you also discussed it, did you not, in, in reviewing all these other facts that had occurred in 1972? Weren't those brought up again? Didn't you say you talked to Director Schlesinger about that? I talked to Director Schlesinger before. Dean's call. But he knew about those things. He knew about the events that had gone before, yes, sir. Well, in your discussions about this latest request from Mr. Dean, did you and he raise the question that uh, this looks like a cover-up over there at the White House that Mr. Dean may be involved in? No, sir. I think we regarded it as making an improper suggestion to us that would incriminate the agency, which was not implicated. We refused to do this. And Mr. Dean asked nothing further of us. But why, why would he want to incriminate the agency? That wouldn't do him any good, or the cause that he was so eagerly working at at that particular time, would it? I don't know what his motivation was, Senator. Motivation to me looks like he wanted that material out of there so that it wouldn't be seen by the prosecutors as somebody in charge of prosecuting the case. It was that's, that's definitely a part of the cover-up. That could have been the case, yes, sir. But anyway, there wasn't any discussion about that. No, sir. Well, <clears throat> I think my time has elapsed, and I certainly agree, uh, as I say, with some of the Talmage that the CIA is, is clean and not uh, involving themselves in this uh, messy business that we've been discussing here for several weeks. 
But I do wish that somebody had warned the President of the United States. It would have been very helpful, I think. That's all. Thank you, Senator. Mm. I'd just like to announce that Senator Montoya is in, as floor manager of the pending bill before the Senate, for that reason, cannot be here. Uh, <clears throat> General, uh, at the first uh, <clears throat> approach of John Dean to you was to inquire whether or not the, F the CIA was involved in uh, the Watergate break-in, wasn't it? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And you assured him, as well as everyone else you conversed with, that, that, that the CIA had no part in the Watergate burglary. That is correct, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Then uh, he told you that uh, the prob he had a problem, his problem was to uh, stop the stop the investigation with the five uh, men that were caught in the Watergate. And he wondered whether the CIA could afford him any assistance. And you informed him that the CIA could not afford him any assistance on that, in solution that problem, or, and would not. That is correct, yes. Jim. And uh, as you state, this whole, uh, your communications about this matter with either Mr. Dean or anybody else oh, covered a period of only the period from uh, June the 23rd to June the 25th. Eight. 28th, I mean. And that uh, no further approaches of any kind were made to the CIA and uh, that you uh, assumed that uh, whatever problem that, uh, that the dean, deans, that uh, the communications you had made the dean had put an end to any effort to uh, enlist any aid of any kind on the part of the CIA. That was my impression, yes. Mr. Chairman. Now, uh, you were asked whether you thought that uh, you should have made any communication to the President, but you were aware of the fact that on uh, July the 26th, July the 6th, you were later acquainted by Mr. L. Patrick Gray, the acting director of the FBI, that he had communicated with the president and that he had informed the president that uh, some of his aides were uh, doing him mortal, mortal injury. That was what he told me, yes, yes. sir. Now, uh, you have uh, testified uh, so clearly that I have uh, no further questions. I just wish to make two comments. I assume from your evidence that you uh, accompanied uh, President Nixon when his vice president on a uh, tour to South America when he was uh, uh, suffered attacks by uh, individuals or groups down there. Yes, sir. And you testified that he displayed uh, great uh, courage. And I would like to say that from at that time, from hearing what I heard over the media, and what I read in the newspaper that I certainly concur in that opinion. I would also like to say that I could concur in your opinion that in the precarious world in which our nation now exists, that uh, one of the best ways to make it certain that our nation can remain a free country is to have an efficient and viable organization like the CIA. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. General, <clears throat> I've told a number of witnesses, almost every witness, I guess, that they should not assume from my questions that I believe or disbelieve their testimony or that the nature of the inquiry signifies anxiety or concern on my part or satisfaction, but rather my questions are designed to elicit particular information and in some cases to test that information against the testimony of other witnesses, documentation, and circumstances. I'm sure you understand that. I do, sir. It may be that some of the questions I'm going to ask you, you have no personal knowledge of. If that's the case, I'd be happy to be directed to a better primary source of information. 
I have today received three bound copies of documentation which I understand was supplied by the CIA to the staff of this committee. I have not yet had an opportunity to examine it. Well, I understand from Mr. Dash that the material was supplied by the CIA to the Appropriations Committee and to the staff of the Appropriations Committee to the staff of this committee. But in any event, the significant thing is that I've only just seen it, and there has not been an opportunity to read it and digest it. So if I skip around a little, it does not mean that I uh, am trying to pinpoint a particular item of being of significant importance, but rather that that's what I've been able to run across so far. Let me state one other thing in preamble. I'm in no way trying to buttress the idea that the CIA was involved in Watergate. I'm making no such allegations. I have a great respect for the CIA and a great appreciation for what it's done for you, for Director Helms, for all of those other great gentlemen who've served this nation, I believe, very well and very diligently. So with that preamble, I'd like to ask you a few questions. I notice in this document a whole series of letters from uh, McCord to the agency. Are you familiar with those letters? I became familiar with them, I would say, in the beginning of June of this year, Senator. Now, to begin with, Mr. Chairman, I might note, as we have on previous occasions, that these documents are nominally classified top secret, handled via comment control system only, and marked inside on several pages for administrative use only and sensitive. We understand, I understand, Mr. Chairman, that insofar as the evidence that may be material that may be contained in these documents is clearly relevant to the inquiry of this committee, that we have the authority by communication from the White House and by the inherent authority of this committee and of the I, I, Congress to put them in the record notwithstanding. I so construe our authority. Would you bear with me just for a moment, General, while I go back and try to find the uh, McCord letters? Look in your index there, will you? I'm sorry for the delay, Mr. Chairman, but as I say, it's only while questioning began that I've had an opportunity to look at these documents, and I noted their location by paperclip, and that turns out not to be the very best form of indexing. Maybe you can tell me, General, while we're still looking for these letters, how many letters were there from Mr. McCord to the CIA after he was arrested on June 17th that are reflected in these documents? Senator, it is quite difficult for me to answer this question since I had no personal contact and knowledge of them until I heard about them in a general way about a month ago. you are aware that there are a number of them. Yes, I've heard that discussed and mentioned. Have you read the letters? No, sir, I have not. There we go. I'm referring now to what appears to be copy number two, tab in and the first entry is a letter dated January 5th, 1972, which simply says notes and is unsigned 
but which has accompanying it a Xerox copy of an envelope addressed to Paul F. Gaynor, G-A-Y-N-O-R, 4629 35th Street North, Arlington, Virginia. Do you recognize that name? I believe that is a member of our organization, yes. Is that a standard method of reaching, uh, conveying information to your agency? I wouldn't know, sir. Do you know who Mr. Gaynor is? I know that he is an agency employee. I do not know in detail. What do you know why him. Mr. McCord would be writing to him? I have heard it said that he knew Mr. McCord when Mr. McCord was still working with the Can agency. Can you tell us what Mr. Gaynor's function is? It's, I believe uh, he works in the Office of Security, Senator. I'm not sure of that, but I believe he works in the Office of Security. Did he work with Mr. McCord when Mr. McCord was in the Office of Security? I have been given that to understand. I have no personal knowledge of it. Much of this is information we already have from the testimony, Mr. McCord, and I guess an additional preamble might be in order. I'm not trying to contradict the testimony, of Mr. McCord. As a matter of fact, much of this corroborates it, but I want to do this to reach a final area of inquiry. The January 5, 1972, quote, note says, the outfit tried to lay the operation at the feet of the CIA this week and failed. Paragraph 2, yesterday they tried to get all the defendants to plead guilty, thus protecting those higher up from involvement, and that failed. Barker and Hunt allegedly were willing to plead, so it is said. McCord and Liddy refused. 3, in revenge, now the prosecution is planning to state that the motives of at least some of the defendants was blackmail. This came out in the ACLU hearings today in which the ACLU lawyer said that he was told this by the prosecution, that blackmail was the motive. Four, the outfit is even getting predictable. It was anticipated that when I refused to implicate CIA, they would undertake a massive character assassination attempt. Five, the judge is not buying this ploy. He indicated as much this morning, referring to it as a cover story, and indicating that the world was watching this case, the Democrats were criticizing its handling, and that the jury was going to get to the bottom of it. He said that he would personally examine the tapes of testimony and send any of the grand jury that involved higher-ups or lower figures involved. Some of the newsmen say they are scapegoats. We are scapegoats. They are right. Corrected telephone call data. Call to Israeli Embassy, September 21, 1972, 8.35 a.m., telephone 762-8720. Call to Chilean Embassy, October 10, 1972, 4.50 p.m., telephone number the same. They're ditto marks under it. Do you have any idea why Mr. McCord would be passing on that information to the CIA? I have no idea why he might, sir, except uh, what I've read in the newspapers. I gather he still felt a certain sense of loyalty to the CIA, and he was anxious that it not be blamed for something for which it was not responsible. And once again, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but... Is the fair inference to draw from that information that Mr. McCord was at least hoping that you would investigate whether or not those calls to those two embassies were recorded? I do not know what he was thinking, uh, Senator. As I told you, I had no knowledge of this letter until June of this year. Thank you, John. Of the existence of it. The next page, it would appear that we've headed, that, uh, headed them <coughs> off at the past, at the pass. It would appear that we've headed them off at the pass. The crisis appears to be over. Also addressed to Mr. Gaynor. Are you familiar with that statement? I, I believe these were published in the newspapers, unless I'm mistaken. These letters? I don't know where they were, but I have read them somewhere. I have, I have heard that statement before, yes. Sir. We took them up to the brink on this, but I don't believe they'll try it again. I'm reading parts of it because yes. it's very long. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the collection of McCord letters together with the cover envelopes might be received in evidence as an exhibit. Without objection, is so all The next item is unaddressed, but it's dated December 29th, 1972, and it appears to have been transmitted in an envelope also addressed to Mr. Paul F. Gaynor, postmarked from Rockville, Maryland, on the 29th of December at the same address. What is needed? is the salutation. Evidence of illegal government wiretapping of our telephones, either of nation on national security grounds or domestic security grounds, both of which are done on authority of the Attorney General signature alone. There were two national security calls by me from our home phone, 7620187. One was made to the Israeli embassy on blank, and the other was made to the Chilean embassy on blank. 
Both calls were witnessed by my wife. He testified to it. I am convinced that from at least June 17th, early July, there was a wiretap on our home and office phones on authority of the AG signature alone. On June 26, 1972, the Supreme Court declared such wiretaps illegal, and several cases have been dismissed on these grounds. Recently, rather than disclose the adversary proceeding in the adversary proceedings, the contents of such calls and conversations, and the names of the party involved. There is no question but that our home and office phones are still being tapped. It is being done without a court order. We are in an excellent position to have the cases dropped. What I need is proof logs, transcripts, or testimony from an FBI agent or two who had monitored such calls, evidence of perjury or false swearing by Gary Bittenbender, the MPD, I take it to mean the Metropolitan Police Department officer. I know he is lying. Some additional evidence, even circumstantial, would help. Going on and reading other portions of the thing. Pardon? I think in fairness to some semblance of completeness of this thing, since I am omitting parts of the letter, but they will in their entirety be included in the record, I might say that also on this tab are statements as follows by Mr. McCord. I have released Gerald Alch as my defense attorney in the Watergate case. In meeting recently in which plans for our defense in the Watergate trial were discussed, he persisted in a proposal that I claim that the Watergate operation was a CIA operation. That is flatly untrue. And when I rejected it, he then went on to make a second proposal. The second proposal then was that I claim that the four Cubans and I cooked up the bugging operation on our own. This was also untrue. When the hundreds of dedicated fine men and women of the CIA can no longer write intelligent summaries and reports with integrity, without fear of political recrimination, when their fine director is being summarily discharged, in order to make way for a politician who will write or rewrite intelligence the way the politicians want them written, instead of the way the truth and best judgment dictates, our nation is in the deepest of trouble and freedom itself was never so in peril. Nazi Germany rose and fell under exactly the same philosophy of governmental operations. Now, I understand that I'm imposing on you, General, but do you, can you give us any insight into why Mr. McCord was passing on these reports to the CIA on a regular basis addressed to this person? Have you ever inquired into it, or can you give me any insight? I haven't really inquired into it. I've just heard it discussed. I gather that Mr. McCord, at least at this period, still felt an intense feeling of loyalty towards the agency. He did believe that somebody was trying to frame it. But it did seem like he was asking for help from the CIA. He may have been, sir, but as I say, I did not see these letters. I would like to make one comment, however. It is perfectly obvious that anyone who thinks Dr. Schlesinger can be pushed around or made to write anything that will suit anybody has never met Dr. Schlesinger. I entirely agree with you. I have met Dr. Schlesinger. I've had some rather heated debates with Dr. Schlesinger when he was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, and since I'm on the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. And I must say, we came away, neither of us claiming victory, I think, but I came away with a very, very heightened respect for his integrity and also for his toughness. Six months of working for him gave me the same feeling. I don't, Great respect I wouldn't for imply for a moment, nor would I condone the implication that that description would fit Dr. Schlesinger. I don't believe that for a second. Now, I've just violated the rule that I put on myself that I won't comment on the testimony, but in that one I will. Sir, if I may, I'd like to say that my statements apply to James Schlesinger. Pardon? My statements apply to James Schlesinger, who is the Secretary of Defense. That's right, and he was once head of the CIA and before that chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. Right. And who knows what he may be next. <laughs> uh, I'm reading now from a memo of December 29, 1972, also in an envelope addressed to Paul Gaynor. One paragraph reads, their persistence in wanting to let Gary Alts call Helms to testify and to call Vic Marchetti to lay the background re-CIA employees once caught in the act refusing to admit it. 
also read custom and tradition of CIA along this line. Reading now from paragraph four, the fixed police officer's report. That of Gary Bittenbender, not Carl, as previously reported. The impact of his statement is one which can be read two ways, giving them a fallback position. One, that I claimed to him at the time of the arraignment that this was a CIA operation, and B, that this was an operation which we, the Cubans and I, cooked up on our own. No such statements were made. They're absolutely false. Now here is uh, a simple sheet of paper that has the words Mitchell, Dean, Magruder, Colson, and Liddy on it, attached to that memo with no explanation. And beyond that, the MPD officer's name is Carl Bittenbender. The pressure is still on. They can go to hell. Anytime you need me to testify before a congressional committee in your behalf, just yell. Now this was addressed to Mr. Gaynor of the CIA, was there any thought that you know of in the CIA of calling Mr. McCord to testify on behalf of the CIA? No, sir, not that I've ever heard of. Another one, handwritten to Mr. Paul Gaynor, postmark Washington, D.C., and the post date is illegible, and there's none on the typed memorandum, Jack. Sorry to have to write you this letter, but felt you had to know. If Helm goes, and if the WG operation is laid at CIA's feet, where it does not belong, every tree, every tree in the forest will fall. It will be a scorched desert. The whole matter is at the precipice right now. Just pass the message that if they want it to blow, they're on exactly the right course. I'm sorry that you will get hurt in the fallout. Another one, December 22nd, 1972, addressed to Mr. Paul Gaynor at a different address, 1005 South Quebec, Arlington, Virginia. Dear Paul, there is tremendous pressure to put the operation off on the company. Is the CIA referred to internally sometimes as the company? Sometimes. Don't worry about me no matter what you hear. The way to head this off is to flood the newspapers with leaks or an anonymous letters that the plan is to place the blame on the company for the operation. This is of immediate importance because the plans are in the formative stage now and can be preempted now. If the story is leaked so that the press is alerted, it may not be headed off later when it is too late. The fix is on one of the police officers in the MPD Intelligence Department to testify that one of the defendants told him the defendants were company people and it was a company operation. He has probably been promised promotion for changing his story to this effect. Be careful in your dealings with them. I will do all I can to keep you informed. Keep the faith. And another one. Addressed to Mr. Richard Helms. Director, Central Intelligence Agency, Langley, Virginia, on a postmark, I believe, of July 30th, 1972, marked personal. From time to time, I'll send along things you may be interested in from an info standpoint. This is a copy of a letter which I sent to my lawyer with best regards, unsigned. And another one. There is no accompanying envelope as far as this compilation indicates. Dear blank. A few interesting bits of information you will be interested in. When Paul O'Brien was engaged by the committee as their lawyer in this case, the committee told him that the operation was a CIA operation. He says he did not learn otherwise until one of the defendants told him the facts and he says he blew up over it. The prosecution under Silbert had, of course, begun that line with Judge Belson from the very first hearing, although never coming right out and saying so, it was inferred by him in every hearing that I witnessed and learned that he did so with the other defendants in the bond hearings. Now that the CIA story has not held water, or more correctly, will not be allowed to stand by the CIA, 
The prosecution is now planning to change to charge that Liddy stole the money for the operation from the committee and in turn bribed McCord and Hunt to participate, giving McCord a $16,000 bribe on one occasion witnessed by a participant who had turned state's evidence. Rest assured that I will not be a patsy to this latest ploy. They'll have to dream up a better one than this latest story. The state's witnesses not only be impeached on the stand, get to be charged with perjury before the grand jury, the federal official, if it has to be such a statement to them. If the committee officials have alleged that Liddy stole the funds for such operation, they also have perjured themselves or are subject to such a prosecution. Liddy may stand still for this, but I will not. And a final paragraph, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop reading. As I have mentioned before, I don't think a fair trial is ever going to be obtained in Washington for the reasons I have heretofore stated. The prejudicial press coverage, the high percentage of registered Democratic voters from whom the jury would be picked, and the pro-government leanings of such a jury, most of whom would be employed by the government and subject to a bias or duress from the prosecution, are only some of the reasons. The matter of timing of a change of venue motion is, I realize, best left in the hands of the lawyers. The fact remains that I've lived in Washington since 1942 and know certain things about the District of Columbia from firsthand knowledge, having lived there in the past, that I wanted you to be aware of. Now, Mr. I mean, General, as I say, I haven't had time to read all this. There's there's a veritable forest of paper clips that I've put on this thing already, and I'm going to read it over the weekend if I can. And I want to talk about it some more. It would appear obvious to me that since you came on board in your present capacity or your service in other capacities to the agency, that you do not have first-hand knowledge of this. But I was on board at the time, but I do not have first-hand knowledge of it. Well, I'd appreciate your advice on who would have first-hand knowledge of it so that I can talk to them. I would say probably the best man to talk to would be Mr. Osborne, who is our Director of Security. Can you venture any estimate based on your examination? Or Mr. Helms. All right, sir, thank you. Can you venture any estimate based on your knowledge of CIA operations of Mr. Hunt or the facts as you found them since June 17 on any reasonable basis as to why Mr. McCord would be giving you this information periodically and regularly? I tried to explain it previously, Senator. I believe Mr. Hunt felt a very strong sense of loyalty to the agency. I believe he felt there was a conspiracy against the agency that, uh, to involve it and discredit it. And this is what I believe, and this is purely my own personal opinion, and I can't substantiate it with anything other than my judgment. Would you, that he thought, would you conduct an investigation or cause one to be done at the CIA on why McCord was in touch? and uh, certain other matters that I'd like to discuss with you more privately about. Had it, been, had it come to my knowledge at the time, I would have, Senator. Yes, sir. And the one to address that to now would be Mr. Colby? Mr. Colby. Well, technically, it would be me today, but if he's sworn in tomorrow or the next day, it would be him. Why don't I ask you and you pass it on to Mr. I Colby. will, Senator. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These uh, letters would indicate, or rather, these letters, in my judgment, would... Uh, corroborates certain testimony to the given by McCord to this uh, committee to the effect that there was a plan among some people to try to blame this on the CIA and uh, that uh, including his own lawyer and that uh, he uh, resented it and uh, knew that uh, I believed with uh, all the intensity of his nature that the CIA was not implicated in any way in the matter. Chairman. Is that not a correct uh, That would be my assumption yes. also, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I might say, since that represents a commentary on my interrogation, which I appreciate, yeah. but that is certainly one interpretation, and that's why I went to some pains to explain that I'm not making charges. I'm simply inquiring for information. But I'm afraid it is not the only possibility. And I think I owe it to myself and to the committee to try to find out as much as I can. And in addition to uh, talking to, Mr. to Director uh, Colby or possibly to Ambassador Helms 
or Mr. Osborne or others, I think I'd like to talk to Mr. Gaynor. I think I'd like to know whether he ever answered those letters and what, if any, action he took. Thank you, sir. Very well, sir. Well, I certainly concur in your opinion. We ought to get as much light on this subject as we can. Senator White, do you have any other questions? I have a few more questions, Mr. Chairman. General Wallers, you've indicated that Mr. Haldeman gave you a, a direction, maybe that's the best way to phrase it, to carry to the acting director of the FBI. Well, let me quote exactly from your memorandum here. Haldeman said the whole affair was getting embarrassing. It was the President's wish that Walters call on acting director Bell Patrick Gray and suggest to him that since the five suspects had been arrested, this should be sufficient. It was not advantageous to have the inquiry pushed, especially in Mexico, etc. Director Helm said he had talked to Gray on the previous day and made a plain to him that the agency was not behind this matter and that it was not connected with it. And as I gather, when you and I were talking before, uh, you indicated this well could have been based on something that was within his knowledge that might not be in your knowledge or the knowledge of the director. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Well, if that was the case, why wouldn't he tell you what it was if this was something within his knowledge? I don't know why he wouldn't tell me, sir. Just one quick question in passing here, that same paragraph, and suggest to him that since five suspects had been arrested, that this should be sufficient. Sufficient for what? Did that ever occur to you? Not clearly, no, sir. I didn't, right. I didn't draw any particular assumption from it. Now, both you and Director Helms have testified that there was a discussion of Mexico. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to leave it in a, in, a, in a broad way. I don't know whether it was Director Helms referred to money. Uh, you've indicated that it didn't come up then, but there was discussion of Mexico, yes. Mexican relationship, et cetera, rather yes. than anything specific as money. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Now, do you think that that discussion was substantial enough so that a man of normal recall would remember it? I mean, was it, did it, form a part of the discussions that, that morning? It did, Senator. The way I understood it was, he felt that if the FBI continued its investigation in Mexico in some way which was not clear to me, it would uncover either personnel or activities of the agency in Mexico. So that it did come up in more than just a casual way. Oh, it was quite specific. It was and, quite specific. And the request to the FBI to, in a sense, uh, not push the investigation to that point was limited only to Mexico nowhere else. Now, may I read to you from Mr. Haldeman's testimony before this committee? Uh, on page 6202. Mr. Dash, do you recall discussing at that meeting that one of their concerns was that the CIA might want to have an investigation by the FBI FBI with regard to, to the Mexican money. Mr. Haldeman, no, I did not. Mr. Dash, Mexican relationship. Mr. Haldeman, I don't recall the Mexican question being raised either by the President that morning in his instructions to me to hold the meeting or by me in the meeting. Do you dispute Mr. Haldeman's testimony on that point? I'm a stand on my own recollection of the matter, Senator. I have no further questions. Sure. Fred, you have a question. Uh, General, on, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you for your appearance here and for the testimony which you've given the committee. Thank and, you, Mr. Chairman. The, the committee will stand in recess till 2 o'clock.
In a moment, we'll hear from another figure in the alleged Watergate cover-up, former FBI Director L. Patrick Gray. Public Television's coverage of these Senate Watergate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. <laughs> 